Brilliant. Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Children, Culture and Community Scrutiny Committee. Uh, I'm Councillor Emily Nelson. I'm Vice Chair. I'm just going to be chairing until Councillor Nichols arrives as he's been held up a little bit on his way in. Um, very pleased to have so many wonderful guests this evening and we're really looking forward to hearing everything that everyone's got to say. Um, and thank you very much for the reports that everybody has written and worked on and presented to us. Um, some really good stuff in there. So uh, we don't have any public speakers for today. Uh, so we're going to just move on to declarations. declarations of interest. There you go. You can see I've not had this days. Uh, yes, if we can have some declarations of interest. Uh, Councillor Clark. Uh, thanks, Vice Chair. Um, yeah, item four and item five. Item four, my partner um, was involved in the bid making process for Reach early on uh, and met um, members of the steering committee, the steering group. Um, but obviously, there's no um, decisions to be made tonight. So I've taken advice so I can participate in the uh, into tonight's into proceedings. And then uh, item five. Um, is that my employer, your Travellers Trust, is uh, referenced um, in that report, although obviously there's no details there uh, um, of of that project, and um, it's all on my regular register of interests. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Crawshaw, did you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so in relation to items four, five and six, uh, so item five, York Museums Trust. I'm a trustee of York Museums Trust, um, so I will not take part in that item. Um, I've taken advice from the monitoring officer who says, fine to sit at the table and listen to the discussion, but um, I won't I won't ask questions. Um, and so item four, um, York Museums Trust is part of the REACH partnership, but uh, I've not been part of any of that discussion, so I will take part in item four. And item six, uh, which is York Theatre Royal, uh, myself and Councillor Knight are both observers to the board. Um, so just for openness, but there's no reason for us not to take part in the discussion. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, I was going to say, does anyone have anything that's noted for you as well, Councillor Knight? Councillor Runciman? Um, item six, I'm a trustee of the Theatre Royal. I'm not involved in the management now in any way. Uh, so I won't be withdrawing, but that is on my declaration of interest anyway. Very well. Uh, Councillor Cuthbertson? Chairman. Trustee of York Theatre. Yeah. Councillor Waller? Thank you, Chair. Uh, in relation to items 4, 5, 6 and 7, I am a governor of York High School, which is mentioned, uh, and at Westfield Primary School, it isn't uh, mentioned. And I'm uh, quite happy. Um, with the debate that was had in relation to the uh, discussion on football uh, at the time to declare how many matches I have seen uh, and, and my commitment to football when, when necessary. I don't think that'll be necessary, Councillor Waller, but thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Knight? And just a further one, I don't know if this is um, relevant, but I am on the police fire and crime panel, so in relation to Article 41, Thank you very much. Is there anyone who doesn't have an interest? That might have been a better <laughs> question to start with. Um, fantastic. Okay. Uh, and we've got that noted down. Uh, so in that case, we'll move on to the minutes. Um, Councillor Crawshaw? Yeah, I just needed to propose a just a slight tweak to wording at minute 44 on page eight. Um, in the first bullet point, it says, Councillor Wilson confirmed that Councillor Clark had recently joined Councillor Cuthbertson, Councillor Crawshaw and herself as members of the Education, Health and Care Plan Task and Finish Group. But actually, uh, Councillor Clark was replacing me. Sorry about that. Uh, does anyone else have anything for the minutes that they would like to amend or is everyone happy uh, with that amended uh, thing to go forward? So is everyone happy for us to approve the minutes? Fantastic. So let's get back to the top of uh, the agenda. 
Um, that brings us to public participation, of which, as we've mentioned, uh, we don't have any today uh, for item three. So moving on from that, we have item four, which is the REACH progress report. So uh, I would like to invite Chris Edwards. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris, for joining us today. Uh, would you like to introduce the report or say some words about it? Thank you. Uh, just, just to be clear about REACH, um, REACH is a partnership of 35 organisations, 127 yeah. partners, who actually come together on a voluntary basis, a partnership basis, we're, we're not constituted as any sort of organization. We're very grateful to the Theatre Royal for hosting us for the moment. Um, but it's, it is about our commitment to young people, uh, um, children and young people across the city. Um, as it says in the report, um, what we are trying to do as part of the culture strategy is ensure that every child has access to the arts, creativity, as an entitlement, not as a bolt-on, not as a Saturday school, not as something stuck on the end of the day where people can't necessarily engage, but as part of the universal offer that we make to our children. And the reason for that is the research evidence from the Cultural Learning Alliance, the difference it makes to children to sing, to dance, to play, to create, to be part of a team. It's the same with the football, which is coming later, but to be part of a team performing in, in anything is really, really important. And if we're serious about closing the gap, narrowing the gap in this city between the, the, those who succeed at one end and those who don't at the other end, this is part of that toolkit. This is an incredibly important part of that toolkit. In terms of early projects, some of you know that we did the bags of creativity. We did the bag, we did the bag of creativity with the University of York in terms of the festival ideas and reached every child in the primary school who was uh, basically um, receiving um, support. So we put 2,050 bags into the primary schools. We worked with the um, York St. John University in terms of the doodle books and produced 2,000 doodle books that again, we took to those harder to reach youngsters and families. Um, we've worked very hard with uh, the um, UNESCO Creative Cities team to engage with drawing with Denmark, which <laughs> that over the last two and three years has been fantastic. And those of you who went to um, the Bar Convent or went to Haxby and Wigington Library and saw some of the product that the children produced and saw how the team in Denmark had animated that stuff such that BBC Look North covered it. And some of our children's work went around the world. It went to Cali, it went to Paris, it's going to Braga. Um, and just our children talking about the difference that it makes, the difference that you can make is really important. In terms of funding, we're really grateful to the City of York Council for the match funding that they provided because as the Arts Council decided that IVE would not continue as the bridge organisation, IVE did grudgingly give us a little bit of funding, but again, they made the condition that we had to provide match funding. And it's only due to the commitment from the council that we managed to do that. So we got 50,000 from the Arts Council, we got 25,000 from uh, the City of York Council. It enabled us to employ uh, a manager who sadly can't be here this evening, uh, Mary Owu, who is a fantastic addition to the team um, and has made such an enormous difference. She has childcare arrangements this evening. So as the volunteer chair, I step in and I'm always prepared to step in and, and be the face for each because it is such an important thing. Um, I, I think that thing about <clears throat> what, what the project has been doing, there's a table in there which talks about the schools. Councillor Waller talked about the fact that Westfield was not involved in the project. Westfield was offered the opportunity because Maxine identified the, the group of schools that we should work with. And Westfield decided that it wouldn't be involved because it was involved in its own project with uh, the University of York. Uh, and I think that's a shame. I think that's a shame, but I, I understand the pressure. And we all understand the pressure that primary schools and secondary schools are under at the moment. 
But we've, we have 11 schools who've bought into the project. We have six additional schools who came to us and said, we want to be involved in this project. So we have 17 schools. Um, and they are doing all sorts of interesting things because the, the, the whole model works on the basis that the project we're doing at the moment works on the basis of someone in the school who passionately believes in the arts, someone from a partner organisation who's a champion, who is prepared to go in and nurture and support the school in terms of its journey. And we've given each school two lumps of money to actually do something interesting, getting uh, an artist, a creative person into the school to do something interesting with groups of children. And again, the target groups of children have been the hardest to reach kids, those kids who don't normally get offered the opportunity. So we've had all of that going on and the champions, you'll see the list of champions and that ranges from just simple creatives and artists right through to the big organizations who are represented over there, um, who again, through their teams have really released the magic. I'm really grateful to Julian um, from Theatre Royal, who's been a fantastic advocate for the work we've been doing and provided some incredible support. Um, as far as the target schools, the listing is in there. As far as the champions, the listing is in there. One of the really important things we think and we're working on at the moment is, is pupil voice. Um, I think there's a myth about culture, that culture doesn't exist in certain places and that culture is about what you know we think of as highbrow and so Shakespeare the Shakespeare Festival is coming we're involved with the Shakespeare Festival we're taking the Shakespeare Festival to all of our project schools because Shakespeare if, you, if you're doing Othello or you're doing The Tempest or whatever you're doing how in the hands of a really talented teacher and a talented professional you can bring that alive for children in terms of modern themes is really important so we are working with everybody who's prepared to help us in terms of this journey um, and children's voices are really important. We are working on how do we make sure that Reach, as it moves forward, listens to young people, listens to young people's concerns and issues. And um, we've done some really interesting research with the University of York, looking at what are the issues for staff, what are the issues for parents, what are the issues for children as we move this thing forward. Um, and that was at the beginning. As we come to the end of the project, um, we're again going to go back and do some research and ask ourselves exactly the same questions. What difference have we made and what more can we do? Um, because it's really important to realise the money runs out on the 31st of July. There is no funding for REACH after the 31st of July. Um, and again, it will be back to a group of volunteers. It'll be people like me who, who prepared to roll his sleeves up and say, okay, let's do another bag of creativity. We're talking to York College about a green bag of creativity, which is in here. Um, and we're talking to organizations and saying, let's just connect, let's connect the pieces so that we don't have this fragmented stuff all over the place. But we say, actually, Shakespeare is an entitlement for everybody. Early music is an entitlement for everything. The theater is an entitlement for everything. The museum, the National Railway Museum, we are blessed in terms of the bits and pieces. But actually, the real thing with REACH is we have realized that they will not come to us. We have to go to them. Outreach is so critically important. And so things like the Theatre Royal's fantastic pantomime, where they took it out, and hopefully we can do that with Shakespeare. We're taking the Shakespeare to all the schools. And we're, we're gonna take the stuff in because it's about first steps. How do we get children to engage, we engage on their ground. And then the first step might be to the local library. I'm also chair of Explore for my sins. Um, so they might come to the local library. They might then come to the theater. So it's about stepping stones and ways of connecting that I think we have to explore. Um, we've also done some work with the Arts Award. Um, we've done a lot of work with professional de development with um, teachers and communications. In terms of the next steps, which I think is, is really important, we're constantly looking at new partnerships. We've, we've made the partnership with um, the, the Shakespeare Festival. We're, we're going again to talk to the university about festival ideas, how we can connect the pieces there, because the work we did with the festival ideas reached a new audience for the festival ideas, young people and families who'd never connected, we connected. And I think it's how do we make that happen? Um, Date for the diary, the celebration event. 
celebration event. We're going to celebrate our children on the 17th of July. We're taking over the Barbican, scary stuff at the moment. We're trying to work out on earth we do it, but we will do it. And that celebration of our children. I remember when I worked here that Janet Looker used to tell me constantly that in the good old days, they had got these fantastic celebrations of children. And couldn't we do it again? It's taken me a long time, Janet. But actually, on the 17th of July, we will do this. We will celebrate our children. And the, the children who we will celebrate will be the children in those 11 schools who are the hardest to reach, the ones that Maclean identified as the ones that needed that extra nurturing and support. So that is what we will be doing. We've also got a creative skills framework. And I, I think the next step for REACH would be to try to look at how we can, within our schools, do work around creative skills. And that, why that's important, because AI is going to mean that all those jobs that are routine and systematic and process driven will disappear. And the jobs that will still be there. And if you want to read a book, Dan Pink's Whole New World explains it. Um, he says, what do we need? Carers, artists, creatives, storytellers. Those are the people where you cannot do that other bit. And so I think what we're going to try and do is work with some schools in terms of developing a creative um, skills approach that actually we can validate. And hopefully at the end, children will receive a certificate from two universities, a college, the City of York Council and other partners that says what fantastic artist creative you are. Um, we are still working with UNESCO on the Drawing with Denmark campaign. If you miss the exhibition at Haxby and Wigginton Library, you didn't miss it because it's still there. You pop in and have a look at the work we did. Um, sadly, we couldn't find a central location that would take it, but we will keep trying. Next year's um, Drawing with Denmark project is delayed slightly because they're taking the current project to Braga to the national, the international celebration of creative cities. They're going to show off. And we're trying at the moment to get the young woman, the two young women who spoke on BBC Look North about their involvement in the project to talk to people in Braga when the conference is on. And the young woman who was at um, Joseph Roundtree School, who was at Ralph Butterfield before, was absolutely fantastic. If you haven't seen it, I can send you the video of her talking about why it's important, why it matters. So, and this year, interestingly, the, the theme for the autumn for Draw with Denmark is about um, hope for my place, hope for where I live. And we think that's another incredible opportunity for us to get our children to think about, well, it's York Central, isn't it? It's, it's the communities. It's what we're doing in Clifton with the library. It's what we're doing in Aiken with the library. It's what we're doing in terms of creating communities uh, that young people want to be part of and want to enrich and do. I, I mentioned the bag of creativity. We are talking to the college about a green bag of creativity. Uh, I think that would be fantastic. It would cost us about five pounds a child. We're looking for sponsorship for those. If we gave it to 2,000 children, that's 10,000. That's a lot of money, but we, we will see. We, we, we're thinking about a pass it forward thing. Could we persuade anybody who's interested to buy one for a child? You know, for a fiver, you can buy a bag of creativity, a green bag of creativity that will go to a child. It's, it's a bit like World Book Day, where we give children books for the 30% of children in this city who have no books at home. Um, and the other thing is, in terms of our future, we're looking at a bid to um, anybody and everybody, but Paul Hamlin, probably. Um, and we are trying to explore whether becoming a charitable incorporated organisation would give us some way forward. Currently, we're struggling because we don't, we're not an entity, so we cannot bid for most charitable funding. So we are looking at CIC, CIO as a possible way of establishing ourselves so we can put in a bid to um, any of these organizations that might help us. Because we do need people like Mary and people like Julian and people like Maxine and people like. Um, Anybody who really cares about this to help us on this journey. This is so important. Um, and it's it's such a powerful partnership. And as the new mayoral thing comes in place, we're, we're looking at how we build stronger relationships with the North Yorkshire LEP and with Coast so that the three can work more collaboratively together. I think I've said enough. That's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Uh, 
and you can really see your passion. Um, it's, I'm always happy to see those Cultural Learning Alliance stats come out. Uh, I think they're incredibly important. So uh, I will open up now for any questions or comments that any uh, members might have. Councillor Crawshaw. Thanks, Chair, and, and thank you very much. Um, I think it's just a great project. And, and, and you know, first of all, we'd just like to, um, you know, offer full support for, for this. It's, it's something that I personally feel really passionate about as well. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, I just was sort of interested um, in terms of the way that REACH works alongside, um, say, for example, the York Music Hub, um, which I think probably has quite a significant overlap in terms of what it's seeking to achieve. Um, and the aims of this are, are fantastic and, and it's great to see so many people involved, but where resources are limited and where, you know, resources both in terms of money, but people's time. And, and um, I'm very conscious as well of schools who um, perhaps get offered things, but aren't always able to accept them because of their own pressures. So where does REACH sort of sit within that sort of patchwork of, of things that are going on in the city to make sure that everybody's complementing each other rather than competing? Um, REACH is the university isn't it? I mean, REACH is a, as, as I said, it isn't constituted as any sort of organisation. It's just a partnership. And every organisation you've men mentioned, and they're sitting there, are connected to REACH. We had the um, director of the the Music Hub on our board. It's, it's been through a huge period of churn and change, hasn't it? And we are now talking to um, the, the Hub about how we take that forward. Um, it's interesting that I think that I mean I was with um, Cherry Fricker this morning in early music, and it's how do we connect those pieces so that um, you know every child gets that opportunity. The, the the problem with with music in this country, I mean when I was here we established the arts organisation. When I went to Leeds we established arts forms which said actually the other art forms are just as important. Why doesn't the government fund those? The government pours loads of money into music. It's squirrelled off to a very select group of human beings. Um, my kids went on a Saturday morning. That was where most of the funding went. How do we make sure that that happened, that reaches the, the children that Maxine keeps reminding me about? How do we make sure that every child plays a musical instrument? How do we ensure that every child dances? How do we ensure that every child sings? Um, and it is, it's about those conversations. And mm -hmm. as I say, we are going back to having members of the team from the Music Hub on our steering group, um, trying to make that happen. I, the, the, the trouble with, be very careful what I say, the trouble with with most of the organisations in York, we're trying, we're, we're struggling to survive, aren't we? And we're, you know, the pressures are enormous. It's like the pressures on schools. I talked to Maxine earlier about school where I'm a governor and Ofsted have been in, and they come out as good, but they still feel guilty about the fact they are. They're not outstanding, and you know, the the, the whole pressure on our schools is terrifying at the moment. Um, I think what we've got to do, and what hopefully the culture strategy does is it says every child should play, sing, dance, perform, create. And then the, the challenge for REACH is how do we and our partnership make that happen? How do we deliver that? How do we deliver that offer to every child? Um, and if we don't, it's bloody miserable, isn't it? Because, you know, when you go into a school and you watch a phonics lesson, or you go into school and watch the daily maths lesson, I don't see any joy. When I go into school and watch children dance, we watch five-year-olds dance and you talk to five-year-olds and you say, can you dance? Everybody says yes. Can you sing? Everybody says yes. Can you? And sadly, a lot of their experience is not like that. The joy bit, I think we have to re-inject into the system. And we've got, you know, we've got some great people who want to make this happen, but, you know, they need support. They need help. How do we target the money to best effect well and also how do we use the volunteers we've got in this city because you know there's if everybody gave an hour of their time we could change the world couldn't we yeah. and, they, and they don't you know um 
but it's it's just the journey we're on. I, I'm happy to talk about how we can do more with the music hall. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, I have Councillor Cuthbertson next. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chris, for that presentation. Um, quite clearly, REACH has achieved a lot in the time it's been in existence. But you've just pointed out that the funding runs out at the end of July. I suppose my question to you is, this report is essentially backward looking. It offers some indication as to the future, but I'd like to ask you, with three months to go, or three and a half months to go, what do you see happening at the end of July? Uh, if it was a business proposition, what sort of three significant figures would you um, estimate would deliver you three different levels of ambition in reach, assuming you can keep volunteers and keep people's interest? When we, we've only had the funding for the last year. It's quite nice, I think. We've only had funding for the last year. Before that, I, I started doing this crazy thing in 2019. Um, and I think someone interviewed me in 2019 with the Arts Council um, and persuaded me to do this. Um, and, I, and for the next two and a bit years, we had no money. And the Arts Council constantly told us, why do you moan about York? You've got everything in York. You know, you are the most, you are high achieving, you've got fantastic resources. What, what, you know, the Arts Council pump, pumps tons of money into the city. Um, stop moaning about it. And we, so we did, we did things. We did the bags of creativity, we did the doodle books, we did draw with Denmark. And I think in September, if, well, worst case scenario, we'll go back and I'll do it again. We'll, we'll, I'll moan at everybody about how we can do things and we'll come up with some creative ideas like pay it forward and volunteers and we'll continue to do stuff that reaches the, the children that need to be reached. Hopefully by September, we also talking to the university at the moment to do another piece of research, which is about the evidence that we can yeah. present to Paul yeah. Hamlin um, to say, this is the difference we've made with very little support. If we could have a three year project we could actually take the work we're doing with those 17 schools to every single school in the city. And again, with a refresh of the um, culture strategy, we could go back and say, well, let's, let's make sure every school does creative skills. Let's make sure every school does dance. Let's make sure every school, because it's falling off the agenda in everywhere. And, you know, I think, do I think realistically we can, we can do that? Yes, I do. I think, you know, if we, what it, they told me, take two weeks to, to establish ourselves as a CIO, um, and then we can get on with the bid and make the bid to Paul Hamlin or Joseph Browntree or some of the other organisations that have got money or the art, go back to the Arts Council and say, is there a way we can get some additional funding? Um, we, you know, if we could do it tomorrow. I, I people people saying no, this will take forever. You can't do it. Um, you know, success comes in cans, not can'ts. I I acknowledge what's been what's been achieved. I suppose what I was asking for was, what are your three outline business plans given certain levels of funding for the next period after July? And yes, I know you could in theory start from square one again. Um, I'm not suggesting you should do that, but I'm wondering what opportunities, uh, what opportunities you could give the young people who are involved in REACH uh, over the next one, two, three, however many years you want to think in, at what kind of cost? I mean, I think that's one of the questions that any funder is going to ask, and yeah. it might be useful to have that, you know, on your list of asks. I think the key bit for us is how do we keep Mary? who's the reach manager, who works 50% of the time, who worked for IBE before, so worked for the bridge organisation to the Arts Council, and so understands the, the thing. Mary has done some really fantastic stuff. How we keep Mary is the first trick. And to keep Mary, we probably need £25,000 a year to keep Mary. Uh, on her half-time contract, and so that, that would be a starter for us. And I think 
that will be part of the bid that we make and how can we make that work is going to be the question. Um, you know, if we had twice as much as that, we could do things twice as quickly. If we had three times as much as that, we could do things tomorrow. But we, we're not going to be in that position yeah. because everybody's struggling. Oh, thank you for that. I think that's a very helpful indication of the kind of money that uh, you might be talking about and also the places you might look, and I'm sure you'll get support. And I'll sign up for some green bags. No, personally. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cuthbertson. Um, as we can see, Councillor Nichols has joined us. Uh, I'm going to continue to chair the rest of this item and then hand over to Councillor Nichols at the end of this. Um, I've got Sarah, uh, Councillor Wilson, sorry. Uh, next. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks. That was a really interesting report. And with my primary school teacher hat on, I'm really pleased to hear that you're going out and getting into schools. I think um, it's a surprise to anybody in this room how busy teachers are and you've got all the curriculum pressures. Um, I would like to say I did try and make my phonics and maths lessons quite fun. You would see the kids enjoying it, but I completely see your point that getting those other creative things are in there. Um, I was just wondering, because I was approached by... Um, one of the residents in Fishergate who had who's linked with um, media arts and the work that they're doing on developing the media arts curriculum. I wondered whether you've got links I can see in the report with various people who are involved, but I didn't know whether there was some. They appear to have some money that they're keen to spend on developing that. I wondered whether there are any links of work you could do together on that. I assure you, we are in the discussions about a media arts curriculum. I'm trying to nudge them away from a media arts curriculum to a creative skills curriculum, because I, I think if, if you if you ask employers, what are you looking for from young people? What they will say is the, the creative art. They won't see may say media arts. Media is one. I mean, digital is one of those aspects, but they want teamwork. They want resilience. They want, um, you know, that, that, that set of skills that is everywhere and sits at the heart of the football stuff as well. That's what they want alongside the, the standard GCSEs, but they're looking for the magic that that brings and leadership skills and that. And we could, with a bit of nudging, I think, take that media arts bit and just nudge it slightly and create something really powerful. We are in the conversations. I assure you that we are all in the conversations. Yeah, of course. And um, I think that's really good to hear because I think having experienced with children coming through often the arts that you're talking about and what get them into what will eventually be the media arts so I think it's a really it's really good to hear that thank you. Councillor Coles are you indicating on this? Yes yeah, sorry just um, briefly just if there was anything you could just add around there used to be a lot more arts and culture and creativity in the curriculum in primary and secondary school a lot of that's gone as you mentioned in your paper um, my question was just really if some of that was added back into the curriculum, either at primary or secondary level, um, if if things were to change around curriculum stuff, just what what it is that reach does in addition to what previously would have been done in a kind of culture arts um, curriculum in school, what actually you're adding just because you're a, a, an outside organisation that is not, you're, you're going into schools, but you're not working to a curriculum, just anything you can add around the value that you add that a school couldn't do. Um, I just think that would be really useful um, to just be aware of the value. You want me to respond first to that? I think one of the things, because REACH is a partnership that is... Um, connecting people who are who have um a professional role within the arts that's the thing that's different because obviously within schools um teachers um bring their own skills to the table but they that their skills are about the subjects that they they deliver if they're secondary school teachers or it's about what they bring in terms of their their general understanding of, of teaching and learning um but what we're what REACH is bringing into the schools is that connectivity between the life of the school and the life of those people who actually are earning a living within the creative and, and media arts. And it's bringing that, that outside world in. Children are able to see that there are people 
who have those jobs and have that way of working and it, it brings that that outside world into the school I mean, one of, the, I think, the successes we've had over the last year <clears throat> is the hub that sit, the children's hub that sits on the Make It Your website. And basically what we are saying to all partners, make sure that you put your offer on there so that teachers have a one-stop shop. You want to go for dance, you go into the, the, the hub and you access dance and you'll find the various people who can give you the support around the dance group. And we want some fantastic stuff going on in the city you, you you know and i think it's like and the frustration i think for me is how we communicate it to um all the organizations it ought to be again the first stop for every creative organization and partnership in the city ought to make sure that their stuff is on the hub so that busy teachers can access it as easily as possible. Because what we want is that opportunity for a teacher to just click in and see what's the offer. If I'm, you know, I want to do some dance. So next term or next year, I want to do some theatre. Next year, I want to do this. And the 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 interesting thing is it being driven by schools is really important because you know, if you believe in what I'm saying, you'll make it work. Teachers who who really understand what the arts can do make it work all the time um, and I, I'm sure your phonics lessons were wonderful but the government's just changed all the rules again and said you have to watch a tv screen for the phonics and you know you have to follow this thing it's a base like Singapore maths and it assumes that children are on a on day eight will be on page eight well they're not kids aren't like that learning's not like that and the thing about the arts is <laughs> It doesn't work like that. It is just fantastic. And that's our challenge. And bringing people like Julian and the football lot. And, you know, that's what brings the curriculum alive, I think. And that's that's what Reach does that's really magic. Um, and, you know, taking, as I said, taking Shakespeare or taking festival ideas, themes into a school and bringing it alive for children actually is just incredible. Thank you. Um, Councillor Crawshaw, was that supplementary? Okay. Well, sort of build, building on, I think, mm -hmm. if, if that's the, the, the way of putting it. Um, so I think, you know, we're we're on the same page. I think there's quite a lot of people around the table on the same page. And, and I think, you know, I've certainly been over the last number of years having this conversation that sort of says, um, you know, you get arts and creativity into schools and actually it, helps with attendance it helps with well-being it helps with attainment outcomes i mean just every measure really it's, it's a positive and yet my daughter currently in the secondary school does uh dance for six weeks you know one half term in pe for the year um, music drama art are all every other week so actually you know in terms of her exposure through the curriculum it, it's gone backwards to where it was even five or ten years ago so what do you see, and, and I appreciate, you know, we're in the public forum and all the rest of it, but, you know, in terms of the barriers, because, you know, we're, we're having these conversations, I think lots of people in key positions are essentially convinced of the argument, and yet still it's not actually happening in terms of schools being able, for whatever reason, to deliver this kind of a curriculum. What what do you see as the key barriers to that happening, and what can the council do to try to remove some of those barriers? Well, I think one of the barriers is that people, most people don't understand what you've just said, how important that is, and the pre the pressure is still. I mean, Ofsted just been involved in an Ofsted inspection. They didn't look at culture at all. They didn't actually consider any of that stuff. And as you say, we've got evidence that is, I mean, what, what the, the figures around mental health and well-being are terrifying, aren't they? And in terms of preventing that, to make a, to give the child an opportunity to dance or sing or play or create, we know the difference it makes. So you know, we're mad because the consequences of not doing that is going to be up the line with the NHS in terms of them treating hundreds and hundreds of kids whose mental health isn't as good as it should be. Um, I think it's back to that thing. Every school should have on its notice board, its staff room and on the, the, the boards in, in classrooms, stuff about why this stuff matters. It's magic. How, you know, every child has such incredible potential. Every child. 
And our job as educators, I mean, I've been doing this for such a long time, and our job is to release the magic. Our job is to find the things that make a child come alive. And if it's dance, what, what you find is they, they are then doing all those other things. They're coming, they're attending, they're engaged, they look at other stuff, their, their language and their maths improves. All the indicators. Why on earth would the DFE in Ofsted not be supporting that? You know, the 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 uh, the number of people doing GCSEs in the art subjects has gone down by forty five percent in the last three years, and the government are not funding university courses in the arts. And they they you know science technology. I I mean I'm a physicist and a mathematician, and you know I know those things are important. But without that other stuff that brings us alive as human beings, we are completely lost. And we don't have a DFE who really understand that. We do not have an Ofsted that really understand that. Um, and I just think it's really sad. And I, I think as a city, what we could do is say, actually, I've had enough of this. Let's put in place the York curriculum that says every child will do this stuff. Because some other places are developing. Legion's developing its own curriculum. North Nottinghamshire has got a curriculum linked to the mining industry in the past. We need a thing that says the media, media arts and creativity is the future of this city. And how do we then build that into the curriculum? Um, and what we would do is we would generate the next group of leaders and creatives and kids with magic and dancers and singers and goodness knows what else. And that would be great. And I'm going to retire. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's lovely to hear you nod to the Leeds curriculum. I was going to ask you a question about that at the end. Um, Why don't you do it? It, it would be a fabulous thing for oh, York. Small, it, I, I think the interesting thing about York is you can do things on a small scale. I worked in Leeds for 10 years and I know that the sheer scale of the thing is different. Um, and, you know, with... 300 and whatever it was schools that we had it you know there were economies of scale there were things you could do there wasn't anything that nobody you know i've got a problem someone else has sorted that and you've got but in a small authority with little bits of cash and little bits of resource and little bits of effort and energizing the volunteers and the partners we could do something just incredible and i've you know i think there's so many people who'd help Absolutely. Um, Councillor Runciman, you had a question. Thank you. Um, Chris, I think what you're doing with very small amounts of money is admirable, but I want to ask you about whether you consider filling in the gaps. Um, I was a, a governor of uh, Joseph Rantry School uh, for quite some time. I don't think you'd need to tell them stuff about drama. They do wonderful drama, as do other schools. And in the primary sector, I can think of Wigington Primary, who you and I know well, who have choirs going at all levels. And I wonder if when Mary goes in or whoever, she says, oh, well, we'll give them something different from what they already do. Because you keep saying about the trouble with music, which in my case, as I started out life as a music teacher, um, you, you, you actually spend your whole time and the evenings and the weekends with, with orchestras and choirs. Uh, and I wouldn't like... Uh, you to try and push in something else if it was there already. But I would like you to use the talent that's there, because as you know and I know, there's a lot of talent out there in the schools and it can be used and developed and they perhaps need another arts form to go alongside it. Um, I was uh, on the theatre board for some time. They do marvellous work with the schools, absolutely fantastic work, unless they've suddenly stopped since I came off, which I very much doubt. <laughs> Um, you 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 need to mesh it all together, really, and I want to know if that's something that you consider. As a partnership, I mean, Julian at Theatre Royal does brilliant work with groups of schools every year. The youth groups are fantastic. Um, the, the Music Hub does great stuff. We've got really talented teachers in schools doing remarkable things. It's how... I mean, it's how we can sort of bring that stuff together to make sure that those schools that 
do miss out on this stuff. And those teachers who are not as confident get the opportunity. We need to share and network and learn together. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's what we're doing. It's what Maxim was saying. Um, we have such a rich um, pool of stuff that we can draw from. How do we make sure that, you know, that, that works? And in the past, when I was here, I mean, basically we had one team working with all the schools where you could look at all those aspects of the curriculum together. We now have what, seven or eight separate element, fragmented pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Um, it's how we get back to that. And I know the authority is doing some um, work so that music teachers come together, arts teachers come together, math teachers yes. come together. Yes. That, yes. Those things that we had in the past, I think we have to sort of try and get that going again. Um, but you're right. We we don't dismiss the work that everybody's doing um, there, but you know there are so many young people who still miss out. You know, thirty percent of children. The the figure is thirty percent of children in the city don't have a book at home. We can do something about it tomorrow, can't we? We've got loads of books at the library. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, your mic still on, Councillor Robinson. No, it's fine. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Knight. Thank you. Yes, just um, a quick observation or, or comment rather than a question as such. It's just, uh, it occurred to me about the green bags of creativity, which I love that idea. Yeah. I've got an environment and, and waste background. Um, it just occurred to me, have you thought of approaching Allerton Waste Recovery Park? Because the parent company, Ferrovial, is an international organisation. They have a fund. Uh, and I know from previous experience with my other hat on that whilst they do a lot of things and funding in North Yorkshire, York hasn't had much of a look in. And it is a joint City of York Council, North Yorkshire Council adventure. So I, I would recommend you get in touch with them and see if, the, if there might not be some, some wiggle room there for the, the green bags because I think it's a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. And frankly, if you're doing the sales pitch, I'm amazed that volunteers aren't queuing around the corner <laughs> because I want to sign up now and I haven't really got time to do it, but I still want to. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Knight. Um, I haven't got anyone else on my list, uh, but I have a couple of questions for you, if that's all right, and then we'll move on to the next item. But um, so what the thing that I was really interested in apart from the whole report obviously um was the kind of the one-stop shop element the the pulling together of what's available in york i think that's really important um and i know in your report you mentioned that research had been done that kind of shows that one of the big issues we have as a city is either you know the offer not being there consistently that's a sort of perhaps separate thing or when that offer is there then people not knowing about it so um what I was kind of wanting to ask is how does Reach see, so having the hub is great, but you still have to know, know where to look. How does Reach see its role developing in terms of kind of really being that intermediary? And it's interesting because I was in Westfield Primary School a little while ago, uh, and this came up as a sort of just in discussion, and they think it's great, but they were kind of, uh, the teacher that I'm talking to said, but we just don't know kind of, it would be great if someone could just say, here are all the things actually that would fit in your, in what you're doing already. Um, so how does Reach see itself developing that, that role really? If there's still money for people. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were blessed with having uh, Bethan, who was part of the Make It York team, who worked with us to try to bring that alive and, and create that thing. I, I think probably the mistake we made with the hub in the first instance is that we created it so the way into the hub was through curriculum subjects. And now, okay, we listened to teachers and we listened to advice from heads. I think that was a fundamental mistake personally, because I think we should have gone in through the art forms. Because um, a teacher coming to it wouldn't necessarily be saying, I, I'm net, you know, I'm, I'm coming at it from a maths viewpoint. They would probably be saying, next year I'm doing something and I want to inject some dance or I want to inject some creativity or some theatre. So I think it's a work in progress. There's a fantastic range of stuff on there now. 
And I, I think what we have to do is make it smarter and cleverer and more audience driven. So what I would like to see as we look at the next iteration of that, because that would be part of our bid going forward, how we develop it in terms of the next step is there's a there's a teacher input place and there's a child input place. And when you would go into your window, what you do is you find the art forms and you click in that way and you find how you know the organizations in the city that are supporting that art form so you'd find julian and the the stuff at the theater Royal. you'd find the, the the work they're doing at the national railway museum you find the work they're doing at the national center for early music and that that's what people need that thing that clicks them into that the support that's there because they're very very busy and you know, also the time, you know, you're planning a year ahead often. So we just have to be smarter and cleverer in terms of, and it's got to be, it's got to be quick. It's got to be quick. It's got to be easy. That's a uh, really interesting. Um, I've, I work a lot with primary schools uh, over in Leeds. I often find it the other way around, actually. Teachers are going, I've got to do a history trip or a history enrichment thing. I need to find something. And, and that's where, you know, having the way in that currently exists, I think is really valuable, but you definitely absolutely need both of those things. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to kind of ask really briefly or uh, comment on, I suppose, I, I'm really pleased to hear the conversations about media arts curriculum or a creative skills curriculum or for me, place-based education is is hugely significant. It's what I spend almost all of my days doing. I'm incredibly passionate about it and I would love to see us doing that for York. And that that brings around all of those things because place-based media, these are artists who are here. These are, you know, these are the people of York who are significant historically, but because of the amazing things they've done within their art forms, these are the organizations that we've got. Um, but also these are our stories, these are our, you know, our bits of history. This is our geography. I would love to see that for our city and um, as someone who works very closely with the Leeds curriculum, if there's anything I can offer in assistance, I would be very, very happy to because I'm, I really passionately would like to see that for York. Please do. Um, unless you have any final comments you want to make, I'm going to move on. I'm just to deal with that work over last year because without the funding that the council provided, we wouldn't have had anything. And I still be on my own doing interesting stuff, but actually that funding has enabled us to do it. And that summary at the beginning of the report shows you the difference it's made. And if we can affect 17 schools this year, we could affect another 17 schools this year. And in two years' time, we're going to touch every school in the city. Um, absolutely. And keep up the fantastic work. And thank you very much for coming to speak to us and for presenting such a comprehensive report. Thank you very much. Um, I should have noted at the beginning, I was looking at the wrong bit of paper that I forgot to do the apologies, just uh, thought I'd come back to that. Uh, we do have an apology. Uh, so we have an apology from uh, Councillor Pearson, who's being substituted by Councillor Runciman, in case anyone was wondering why Councillor Runciman was here. Apologies for that. Um, I'm going to hand back over to Councillor Nichols now as chair and uh, go back to sticking my hand up all the time. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, apologies for being late. Um... It was a personal matter. I've been waiting nearly three years for an inquest and I wasn't going to leave early. So um, as much as I respect and an interest in this committee, um, that was slightly ahead of this one, I'm afraid. So um, on to the business, we have hopefully York Museum's Trust, Catherine and Paul. Welcome. Yeah, you have to see your own name, I'm afraid. <laughs> are you going alternate or you got your own things or how do you want to <laughs> yes I've kind of figured that we'd sent you a report yeah. we're going to have to be directing into the mic while we're on here where is the mic take this one as well yeah thank you um, I, I think um, we sent you a report and yep. I'm assuming that we're probably a little bit tight on time now. Um, so I'm wondering whether it might be uh, useful just to move straight to any questions that any of you may have from for us based on the report that we've submitted. I'm happy with that. We've all read it, haven't we? Yes, we're very good at reading in this committee. <laughs> so questions then. 
Councillor Waller. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to um, welcome you to this, uh, this committee. I um, appreciate the difficulties that you've faced with materials, um, and it's a, it's a national um, situation. So it was really to understand uh, there had been some discussions nationally about the building industry as a whole facing up to those choices uh, made um, from, from your report in the 1980s, so that uh, uh, is some time ago, but really it's something that you are living with the consequences now. Um, and, and linking that with the letter of credit from CYC in terms of it would be terrible for your organisation to face a cliff edge uh, in uh, March 25, really, in, in terms of uh, thinking back to the um, proce thought processes that went into floating off the, the, the Museums Trust and the the roof of the Castle Museum was one of the key aspects of that in terms of, um, at the time, concerns about competing capital bids and therefore by freeing you up to access national funding, um, that there was the hope that that would give a longer lasting uh, life to the organisation. Thank you, Chair. So on that one, and Paul can jump in if that if that's all right. Um, with the support of Councillor Coles, we wrote um, to both local MPs, asking them to advocate for us as a special case in terms of the rack that had been found in the Castle Museum. Um, at the time of writing, we were the only museum in the country that had rack found within it. There are now another two. So we are a very unique breed. As far as I'm aware, we are the only listed building with rack in it, and we are now a test case study for Historic England. Whether or not we like that status, we are um, we are that status. Um, Rachel Maskell was enormously supportive and got the letter that we had um, sent to her on Lucy Fraser's desk within a week. Uh, I haven't heard back anything from them, but we will continue to chase um, about whether there might be any funds coming from national government because this is such an unusual set of circumstances. Clearly, there is a separate fund which we can apply to, the MEND fund, which is a fund which is made available through Arts Council England. But the maximum we can apply for any one grant, any one organisation can only apply for up to £5 million for that. Um, and we don't need a huge amount of money to put a remedial solution in place for the RAC. So it feels like that would be the wrong bid to make to that fund. And in fact, we'll be bidding for repairs to the Yorkshire Museum um, from that fund, because if any of you have been in the Yorkshire Museum recently, you'll see the huge water ingress problems that we've got there over nationally significant collections as well. So we're working really closely with colleagues um, in CYC to see if we can find the funding for those um, lower level remedial repairs that would keep the Castle Museum open for a good 10 years or so. I mean, the only thing I would add um, is, uh, yes, we're having positive conversations with the uh, uh, officers and executive over the letter of uh, renewal of letter of credit. So yes, those conversations are going very well because as you rightly point out, without it, there is that kind of cliff edge. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I just wanted to add, um, just to build on the point that Catherine made about um, the exceptional case of the Castle Museum roof. Um, you know, it was all over the news when schools were being affected, rightly so. Um, and and there was a national outcry when schools were affected, and rightly so. Um, this is a nationally significant museum. Um, there should be more of an outcry than there actually is currently about the government's failure to um, engage with this issue and the fact that we, as a very cash-strapped council, are very happy to extend um, what we need to do to keep things going. But ultimately, the government should be stepping in here and should be doing their bit to support our 
Museum. And it's extremely disappointing um, that, you know, so far our efforts to get them to hear um, have fallen on deaf ears, but but we will keep trying and anything that this committee is able to do to echo those um, uh, challenges would be greatly appreciated. Councillor Huntsman. Thanks. Um, this is more of a comment than a question. I think when you look at the lists on page 42 and 43, and the, the totals and the numbers of, of pupils that have come from a great variety of schools, including special schools, um, the fact that there isn't any funding or doesn't seem to be at the moment is, is rather a shame, to put it mildly. Uh, and I, there is a question, it's only a small question. Um, if the roof is uh, what's risky and you've got a second floor, can you use the lower floor or, can, or is the whole area out? Oh, I'm sorry you're shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh in 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 kind of in a, in a nutshell the rack is safe the rack has been deemed to be structurally sound which is always a positive thing the complexity that we have is that the bearings that the rack is sitting on no longer meet the specification that was changed by the health and safety executive at some point last year one of the after one of the ceiling falls in one of the schools somewhere else in the country the further complexity that we've got is that rack is quite a porous material. That's, that is the nature of its name, isn't it? So actually, if the roof starts to become wet and we have got some problems with water ingress on that roof, there is a point then that the rack might become structurally unsound. So actually, the issue is both um, needing to underpin the bearings, which isn't a, it's not a significantly expensive job. It's just time consuming and needs big bits of timber and some brackets. Um, but then also we do need to think about the covering of the roof to make sure that we've protected the rack so it doesn't become porous. One of the best ways of describing it is if you imagine, and it's a beautiful York analogy, if you imagine the rack is like an aero, and at the minute the aero is in really good condition and it's underpinned by Yorkie bars and they're also in reasonably good condition, we just need to put another Yorkie underneath. So that's the, that's the, that's the, that's how we've been, <laughs> that's how we've been explaining it to people. It's really helped people understand where we, where we are at the minute. <laughs> Else. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to ask a question that's nothing to do with RAC. Um, so I was really pleased to see you including your kind of uh, schools out sort of in reach uh, statistics and things like that in your report. Uh, I'm aware that your Museums Trust hasn't really had a consistent learning offer for a really, really long time. I know that as a governor of a primary school, we tried to bring, I was sending the children to the Yorkshire Museum, you know, marching them in to find that we couldn't come at all and things like that. So I believe that you've recently recruited an education officer and that you're kind of building up the learning team. Um, I was just wondering if you could kind of talk about the the plans in terms of, it's, it's lovely to see schools coming in a self-guided way, but the offer that I feel like is the most important for particularly our schools in York is being able to access those workshops and those stories. So uh, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Great question. Um, we have a gift in the Yorkshire Museum. So at Key Stage 2 History Curriculum, we can teach the entire of that, entirety of that curriculum um, in, the, in the Yorkshire Museum. Um, and so what you've seen there is the numbers aren't significant. They're not, they're not huge for the last year, but that's because we've been working really carefully to develop a pilot. You're absolutely right. During COVID, our learning program stopped entirely. We're not dissimilar. Lots of cultural organisations um, did that because obviously schools weren't in and, uh, and museums weren't open to the public either. So we've worked really hard. We've been working with um, the British Museum and some funding that's come from a French charity called Art Explorer. We've also been working with Cornwall Museums Partnership. We're the three partners that have been working on this project. It's called Time Odyssey. And the idea is that students will come in, they'll um, look at objects, in the gallery setting, but then they have a virtual tool to be able to use back in the classroom that continues learning. It was originally called, I'm trying to remember what it was called, something bus. That was culture it, bus. culture bus, but it's now called Time Odyssey. So it's, it's supposed to be much more dynamic than culture bus. But the the um, the element of it is that also the, the, the funding to actually get the children to and from the museum is part of the funding that comes from Art Explorer because all too often that can be one of the barriers. So in terms of how we've developed that programme, Charlie, who's our brilliant schools manager, um, has been working 
and primarily with Ebor, Matt, actually, in terms of looking at lots of different schools within um, that group, we've identified that Key Stage 2 is absolutely where we need to be uh, promoting, um, particularly the Yorkshire Museum. And so we will be reopening our learning suites from September and we will be using REACH and the, all the networks that we have there to get out to schools to try and make sure that we've got book, um, groups booked in right the way through um, the whole of academic year 24-25. For those of you that know, and there's two of you teachers in the room there may be more sometimes we really struggle with some of the bits around school visits which are about space for people to have lunch toilets where we can manage safeguarding proficiently where we've you know when there's members of the public in and museums were not designed with those needs um in place and so actually as we're beginning to think about space space planning across that across that building we are beginning to think actually how could we make it easier for schools to come if we had dedicated toilets that no one else used and um, clearly that makes it much easier what would that mean for us to be able to use at other times um in the year how much lunch space do we need how much cloakroom space do we need so it's all those bits that sit around the actual learning provision they're the things that make it easier for the teachers and the, the grown-ups that are coming on those trips to manage them successfully I think. Thank you um just to clarify in a way that so does that mean that your the learning program that you will have going forward is still going to be kind of specifically tied to this project rather than having a kind of standalone learning pro program and team that sits within York Museum's trust regardless of project project funding in a longer term, more consistent way. No, the, the project funding has been there to get this off the ground and up and running. So the member of staff, and we've just recruited someone to work alongside Charlie, are there, there are commitment to this. We, you know, we there's not much point running a museum if you're not welcoming people in to learn about things. We've heard Chris talk about that really eloquently for a little while already this evening. So um that that's something that you know we're committed to doing. We're starting slowly, we're um, prioritising the Yorkshire Museum because of all the, the feedback we've had from the teachers with whom we've engaged. Um, and then we're beginning to look at pockets in the Castle Museum. So we know, for instance, Kirkgate, because of the way you can teach Victorians, is really powerful as well. And then we're doing some beautiful things um, in the art gallery around teenage art school um, and trying to link really carefully into our temporary exhibition programme. So we've got some learning packs around Monet, again, of often also taught at Key Stage 2. So thank you. Past my links. How much? I mean, you gave us the numbers, which was picked up. How much more space have you got? Because obviously, there's a lot of schools not listed in the last year. How is that? Because you haven't got the, the capacity to take them, or is it? That's you... a really good question. Um, we have about twenty five percent of the objects that we care for on behalf of the city on public display. That's not unusual for a museum. Lots of them are in storage. We have nine satellite storage sites in and around the city. Yeah. Um, and so anyone who works in a museum is always going to tell you that they need more space. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't it wouldn't be wrong of me not to say that. So we are doing some space planning at the minute to try and make sure that the space that we are responsible for, we're using as carefully and as thoughtfully as we can to inspire people, to make people feel excited so we can showcase objects and create learning opportunities in the most beautiful uh, way possible. Um, but that can't all be gallery space. Some of it does need to be ancillary space. It needs to be toilet space. It needs to be changing space. We don't have a changing spaces toilet anywhere in our footprints. That's something that we're thinking about as well. Um, and then we need to make, um, we also need to generate income. So we need commercial space. We need dedicated, beautifully designed retail space and food and beverage space. Um, and, and people have much higher expectations of what they might expect or get in a museum than perhaps when the Yorkshire Museum was first designed and built in 1830. Definitely the case in terms of um, trying to operate a museum inside a prison or a former prison. Mm -hmm. So um, we're always working to see how we can use these grade one, grade two listed buildings to the best of their potential. But there will come a point where we will need to think about what different space we might need. Um, and that's a piece of work that we've got in train at the moment. Thank you. Just You said 25% only is on show, which is normal. If you wanted to know what the other 75 was, is that listed? Is it? Good question. I mean, obviously, somebody made that. Oh, I wonder if. Yeah. So I just wonder if, you, if it is. We have <laughs> records of it all. It's prob They're probably not all publicly available on our website. 
Can I just add that having a digital online collection publicly available of all of your things is an, just an unbelievably enormous mission. And if you've got anything available on your website, you're doing very, very well. Um, I also would say we send a lot of school children into toilets that the public use with without too much drama, if that's useful at all. And just a broad question, picking, and I, obviously I only, only got half of the previous speaker. And bearing in mind, we've still got two to come. How much connection is there between that you're not competing, but actually you're passing on uh, and sharing? Really good question. Um, and actually, Paul and I were just talking about that earlier today. So uh, Paul from the Theatre Royal. Um, I've worked in York now for 10 years. Um, and my sense is that there is far greater collaboration and sharing between those people that are working in all of the cultural, the you know, the breadth of cultural organisations um, in the city. So the people who receive funding from the Arts Council, the MPOs meet on a monthly basis. We look at projects that we might be able to work on with one another. Uh, we are, um, we report that back to the Arts Council. Um, and in terms of the other sort of big cultural facing institutions in the city, we all talk quite regularly. We make one another aware of the funding applications that we're doing. We often write in support of one another because we sometimes we might be competing for money, but actually we're more likely to get the money if we support one another and have a, a smart and upfront conversation about who's going to go first or who is more likely to get that funding. So I think there is a huge amount of um, support uh, within the sector um, and perhaps one of the things we need to do as a sector, perhaps a little bit more vocally, is just talk about the impact we have both in terms of economic impact into the city, but social impact and share some of those statistics across that community of cultural organisations rather than doing it individually. And so the, so the Arts Council pulled the bit together that, about the funding. Is anybody else pulling or is that just, as you just said, you're all just smart enough to get on together that, if somebody visits your for your museum, they're going to go to everybody else's museums and offerings. Yeah, we try really hard to do that. And obviously, the things like Visit York, there's lots of joint um, uh, joint promotions uh, and things like that. And then obviously, with things like Little Vikings and Mumbler, so lots of families that either live in the city or are coming to the city, they tend to get that signposting as well. But yeah, we all we all try and cheerlead for each other as much as we can. Are we all happy? Oh no. Well, also, you know, it happened. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say that Paul's been um, working for York Museums Trust for a number of years now. He's been coming to these meetings every year. And I just want to say thank you to you, Paul, because you're retiring shortly, aren't you? So uh, I just thought it'd be nice to thank him in public. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Are you coming back as a volunteer, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> do it for free uh, not a question oh. I just think if we, if as this is coming to a close can we propose that the committee endorses writing a letter to um, the MPs or the correct government department to kind of further support the uh, work that has already been done around trying to get the government to to take some responsibility for the issues around the rack, um, I think that we could have a role there. Can I can I cheat slightly? How much do you want and which minister is it? We need about, well, you know, how long's a piece of string? But now you're going to put me on the spot for that one. I think we need about £250,000 and it probably needs to go to the Treasury via DCMS. Well, it definitely needs to go to the so Treasury. Stuart Andrew, yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. I guess, yeah, right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We've got a gang next. Yeah. <laughs> there's, more, there's more of us than you. So hopefully we've got Paul, Juliet and Julian. Yay. I'm Paul. I'm the, the, the new CEO of the theatre. 
Uh, I've been here since, uh, so that's why I bought the game. Uh, uh, but we are, oh, sorry, can you hear me? Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I mean, basically, I'm just making introductions, and, and I wanted to pass on, on to, uh, to Juliet and Julian because there's lots of things that we're obviously doing at the theatre, but I wanted us to focus today on the work we're doing in the community. Can you hear better? Okay, is it there? Right. Um, work we're doing in the community and the work we're doing through the creative engagement team. Um, I won't get into the conversations around what we're doing on stage in a big way or um, are the other things happening in the building and, and, the, and the capital projects, et cetera, et cetera. That could be for another time. But I thought we'd focus on on fundamentally the work that we're doing out in the community and around the, the, the schools uh, and creative engagement uh, team. So I'm going to introduce uh, Juliet first, who's our creative director, just to talk a little bit about the work that she and the couple of theatre have been doing with the community. Hello. Um, so obviously, uh, I'm sure lots of you will be aware of the large scale community productions that we've had a, a big history of um, in the past. And it was just to bring you very kind of quickly up to speed with, with where we've been with that. Um, uh, post pandemic, we worked very hard to bring those back into being to engage our community again um, as quickly as possible. So we had our first production in 2022, uh, which we held at the theatre, which was the Coppergate Woman, which told the stories of um, the Vikings and uh, also the very recent kind of events of kind of uh, York and the world in large at large as well. Um, and that involved um, over over. Uh, uh, over um, 200 um, volunteers kind of in that and then just last summer in July we we did Sovereign which was a, a very large scale um, in King's Manor um, in the courtyard there which was a, a, a fantastic uh, a fantastic kind of project to do which uh, well over 300 kind of volunteers involved in that and, and really successful. Each time we do these things we target very specific community groups so that we don't just go out to our usual suspects and the people who are closest to us but we try and bring people through who wouldn't normally um, get to us and we support those people through production to make sure that they can stay with it um, we are now uh, preparing for our next one so we're giving ourselves a very slightly uh, bigger window to lead into it so 2025 is our next production and this one uh, we're committed to co-creating with our community so we have started that process by being in kind of conversation and consultation with uh, lots of people who have done our community productions before, but also other groups that we um, have kind of reached through uh, our outreach um, work, which we'll hear a bit more about um, uh, in a bit, um, but also uh, connecting with Make It York and the Trailblazers project that's been happening. So looking at interesting York stories, because as lots of you will know, a main feature of our community productions is that we try to tell York stories and York history. And that's what uh, we have found our community is passionate about getting behind and revealing those kind of stories and um, so we have been doing um, lots of consultation we'll carry on doing um, uh, giving lots of ways for our community to have a voice in what we make and how we make it and we have just um, commissioned the next piece um, which we are, is going to be on Seaborne Roundtree um, which we're very very excited by and there's been a lot of support for and uh, also ties in with the 100 year centenary of uh, the death of Joseph Roundtree so we know that's of interest as well for uh, Joseph Roundtree Foundation and a lot of the things that be going on that year so very exciting a way of kind of York coming together and connecting that that story through obviously very famous family but with us sort of bringing through that um, what we're particularly interested in doing so we're hoping for um, a good recruitment on that one um, but uh, yeah that's a little bit about our community productions I'm going to hand over to Julian who will tell you much more about the ongoing work that we do that's sort of just one of our bigger uh, bigger uh, projects yeah thank you for the opportunity to sort of talk about our work so I head up the community uh, creative engagement team so there's four core members of staff that work on our, our program as well as a sort of a number of freelancers that we work with so I'm just going to refer to my presentation if that's okay which I know you've had in had in advance as well I just sort of flesh it out a little bit um so there's three core areas of our work we have um, a youth theatre so that's an out of school provision and we have currently about 225 children and young people that uh, come with us um uh, weekly um we have a community and outreach program so that work 
work is about building partnerships and working in collaboration with those least likely to, to work in theatre or to work through drama. So that's going out, finding groups and building partnerships and relationships. And then uh, third is our sort of our formal education programmes, the work that we do with schools and colleges and universities. So that work is essentially based around partnerships. Um, we do do one off workshops, but the majority of work we do is building relationships over a sustained period of time, whether that's over a year or whether that's with a with a with a project. Um, it's also about promoting drama as a tool for learning within schools as well, but also providing opportunities for children and young people to come and use our space and perform on our stages as, as well. Um, so just talk about a little bit about youth theatre. So youth theatre happens across community venues across the, the city, which you can which you can see there. So that's a sort of a change sort of post-COVID um, part of the Let's Create Strategy of Arts Council England wanted it to, um, wanted to be out more in the community. And that's just sort of fitted with uh, the ethos that we wanted to do, uh, that we want to fit in as well. So that works across those sort of community settings as well as at the theatre as, as, as well. So there's 15 different groups from five-year-olds up to 19, up to 19-year-olds. Um, our focus is on drama, um, performance skills ensemble there's lots of people that will sing and dance elsewhere we're more sort of on the sort of the drama the sort of the play side but we do have a, a technical and backstage group as well because not everyone wants to perform on stage so that's a new uh, sort of new venture for, for us each of those groups gets to work on performing one of our stages at some point over the year, usually in our studio, in our studio theatre. So this term coming up, our five to eights are doing uh, the Lorax by Dr. Zeus, which is very, uh, very exciting. So that'll uh, visually look beautiful. So we sort of we work over three 10 week terms and we have a three pricing band sort of structure, as well as a really comprehensive access policy um, that provides uh, uh, free places and free mentors for young people that might need sort of um, uh, support with us. So that banding goes goes from 105 to 68 to 30 to 36 uh, as again as well as sort of free places if that's if that's possible we also have an access all areas group which is three referral only groups so we're we're funded by the ed denunzio foundation that supports young people that um either that are socially deprived or just need additional support so those happen again across the sort of the, the city and again young people um uh, if they can progress to our youth theatre, then then that that's great, and we will fund their places as well. But it's really important that we have groups where young people where um, we can we can access them if there might be any barrier at all. Um, we do terminal trips to see to see shows, uh, and also a uh, youth theatre form our way of um, having sort of uh, young people's voices within the organisation. Um, so our community and outreach work is headed by um, Lydia, who's our community connector, has is currently a funded, funded post. So these are just the sort of, these are the current work that she's doing. So she's um, has a group called Wings, which is a female identifying only group, uh, a monthly group, which has come out of an evolution of her work with Kira, women's charity within, within, within the city. That's for adults. And she also works with the hut that are um, opposite the uh, the hospital who are working with adults, uh, predominantly with learning difficulties. So we do a, do a monthly session uh, monthly session there with them. She runs a project called Shakespeare Nation. So we have a long-term partnership with the Royal Shakespeare Company um, through our schools program, but they have a community-based program that we're becoming part of as well. And we're accessing adults who um, uh, focus on sort of mental health and well-being. And we're sort of working with them over a sort of sustained period of time. We were part of the York Mind um, Wellbeing, um, Mental Health and Wellbeing Program, which unfortunately has, has finished now. So this is this is our evolution of that project. So we're always trying to think about legacy what's the net you know they might get involved in a great project but what can they be involved in next so Shakespeare Nation is our, is our evolution of that again that sort of comes with funding and support with with that chatting Mondays is uh, the first Monday of the month where um, anyone can come and have a cup of tea and have a have a chat have a, and just sort of uh, it's a it's a it's a meeting it's a meeting place um uh, through council funding, we do a lot of activities, as I know that uh, the foundation does around half follows activity and food for a massively yeah. successful program for us. Um, I think that program just increasing, get it getting better and better for us again to living at the mm -hmm. theatre, but out in the community as, as well. So we really appreciate the, um, uh, the, the council funding towards that project. And um, also sort of the booking system is working brilliantly for us. So thank you for adding that in. That takes a lot less pressure off, off us as well. Um, access all areas, which I mentioned as well. And Lily is constantly doing sort of lots of taster activities within the sort of the community. Um, so there's um, uh, one that she just told me about today. Is it going to be working with, a, there's a Ukrainian refugee who was a drama teacher and an actress in Ukraine. So we're going to be supporting a group that she's doing with children, um, Ukrainian refugees who are going to be doing a weekly session at the theatre. So she She's going to be supporting that 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 program, which is great. So there's sort of new things happening all the all the all the time. But these are the regular activities that she that she does, and the formal education stuff. It's a picture of me, uh, shockingly 
probably about 15 years ago, <laughs> still doing it. So I know those kids are adults now, probably. Uh, so we, our main project is we uh, have a, what's called a year long partnership. So we work with six city of York primaries over a whole academic year. So the schools buy into that program. We work with every school, every child in that school with a project of some sort. So for example, they might be looking at a Michael Moore Pergo book. So we take a drama approach to, to supporting that, or they might come and see a show and we'll do drama linked work with that as well. Um, um, yeah, and the school, as I said, the schools sign up for that whole academic that whole academic year. With the the RSC program is that's a national project with a number of regional theatres around the country, and that's about advocating and, and improving the teaching of learning in Shakespearean schools through 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 active approaches for what they call sort of their rehearsal room approaches. So we work at currently there's uh, four City of York schools, there's one North Yorkshire school and one school in in Selby. So that funding is specifically for areas of social deprivation. Um, so for their criteria, it needs to be above um, above the average of children on free school on free school meals. So that means that we're sort of targeting a number of schools to try and join that to join to join that program. Um, NT uh, means National Theatre, so we're part of the National Theatre Connections Programme, which is uh, a programme that's been running for many years, that schools come and companies come and perform in our studio theatre and we support their, their day with us there through, through new plays. Uh, Playhouse is our own new writing project, so we commission with, with other national partners um, two new plays a year and bring two back from the big canon of plays, so that's for Key Stage 2. So children, we uh, we give them access to the writers, they have a workshop with the writers, then we support their journey of, of, um, of rehearsing and performing that that play and they come and perform it at the at the theater so again that's a, a six schools as part of that this year which is a, a project that we're doing in july and we commissioned a york-based writer uh, to write one of our plays for us which is great so we have a really strong partnership with the universities within the city particularly of york york st john um so we run a project called takeover which sort of does, does what it says on the tin they're sort of 50 odd um third year and um, performance students all come and take a role within the theater so i have a group that are part of the create engagement team there's a production management team so they're learning skills based on the different areas of the theater and they program the the, uh, the festival in in may so one of our students did a three-day easter activity with children in the holiday which is part of her program so we were supporting her and her in that as well and we also have a, a strong partnership with york college as well and one of our ambitions is to work a little bit more closely with york university this year to see if we can sort of match up all of the sort of the HEs within the sitting and create a, a full house and then we have an sort of extensive sort of work experience and placements that we take sort of throughout that throughout the year and there's other projects that don't fit with those sort of three so for our preschool activities on a friday morning um you'll hear it from a distance is our, our storytelling activity with a company called storycraft theater um, that's about taking a story and a theme and doing a craft activity with the children and their parents and then sort of interactively telling the story with them uh, alongside and we have adult theatre which we have ag um, um, weekly acting classes for for adults and numerous sort of holiday projects playing a weeks um, and lots of the things that we try to sort to do around uh, either around shows or just within the sort of the holiday holiday period um, so yeah we're trying to be as active as we can all four of us thank you thank you questions that's my question Thank you. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that your work in the perhaps more deprived areas of the city is continuing. And there's two questions, really. Um, in my time with you, you used to analyse the postcodes so you could target the areas where you really need to go. That's the first question. Are you still doing that? I think we're more using the sort of the, the free school meals criteria now, or the pupil premium criteria. I think has probably replaced postcodes for us, I'd say. And the second question is, um, if the, I would say the outreach work that you're doing, which I know is, is always very welcomed, um, do they continue? Do you have some that come into the youth theatre and then go on perhaps to be volunteers in theatre, uh, even go to YSJ or somewhere to study? Do, do you have a, a group, perhaps maybe a small number, that continue and go up to... Uh, careers in in associated um, professions. Um, yeah, we do. One of one of our one of our practitioners was a youth theatre member, and again, I taught her when she was sort of younger. So that progression does happen. I wouldn't say it's sort of huge. I wouldn't say it's it's huge numbers. Um, but we do encourage sort of particularly youth as a progression to either to sort of to volunteer or to move up to become an assistant, to become a sort of a practitioner. So that route 
that route is definitely there. And I think as a as a sort as an organization, I think it's incumbent on us to, to support young people into the industry and to be to be advocates for them and to support their to support to support their learning. So that's definitely something that we're really keen to we're really keen to do. One supplementary. I think one thing that's pleasing is um I have a niece who went into theatre work in Bristol, uh, but not as an actor, mm -hmm. as stage management and all the other associated things. And I think that's the bit that's hidden, isn't it? Most children don't see that they see the bit they that's actually visually obvious to them. But there's a whole host of professions in the back that are just as valuable and just as important to make the whole thing happen. Yeah, no, absolutely. I and mean, that's part of the reason why we created sort of the backstage technical group to allow young people that would that don't want to be that, that don't want to be on stage. I think that is, yeah, that, that is incredibly important. But I think the majority of people that come out of our youth that have no interest in being actors or but what they they're using skills that are allowing them to access, um, you know, uh, skill, you know, soft skills I, I don't really like that term but skills that, that they've got the creativity the being part of a group the ensemble skills the being able to stand in front of people and, and verbalize and teamwork are skills that young people are, are absolutely sort of the really key life skills for us and just to add anecdotally i started my career at bristol Orbit because the stage manager so that's interesting 40 years ago but um uh the other thing is that i worked in, in other theaters and and uh there's really clear evidence that people who've gone through the youth theatre process really do get involved in theatre. The person who's now CEO of Plymouth Theatre Royal was in the youth theatre that I used to run, uh, and the woman who used to run uh, New Adventures, mm -hmm. equally in the youth theatre. So it's 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 definitely proven, from my point of view, to be the access to to the to the industry. Okay. I was just going to add to that as well. Actually, the, the the project that we have seen the most clear kind of through uh, through into into industry um, is our takeover project, which we which we started in in two thousand and nine, where people take over the theatre. We now run it exclusively as a as a um, uh, as part of the uh, of the curriculum at York St John. Um, but the, if you if if you look at the the careers of many people who uh, are doing very well in the arts industry, loads of those people came through um, our take over schemes so i think we've we, we've seen a we've seen some really good kind of evidence of that and we continue to do uh to see that kind of happening um through many of our projects yeah thank you chair. yeah thank you chair um i was very interested in your ambition of extending the uh your program to include all he institutions in york um you, I'm sure, heard Chris Edwards speaking about the work that Reach has done, and in a, in a, there's a sort of something of an echo there in your aspiration. I have to say, uh, given the facilities that we've got in York, the ability of different groups to have access to those facilities would be very, very welcome. Um, York hasn't got a particularly good um, stage arrangement. It does, however, have a cinema, um, a, a filming and produ production theatre, which might be very interesting. I don't know if you've seen it, used it, heard about it. All three. Um, do you mean the University of York? The their their yeah. their, their, their sort of their, their film. Yes, yeah, we 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 do know about it. And as I say, University of York is the one that we've worked least with, really. Um, but we uh, we are we are beginning to uh, to to respond a bit more to them. I mean, it just occurs to me that um, if you could extend that connection downwards to FE, then to secondaries and to primaries, and have a kind of a an expanding yeah. expanding mix of people going up through the different um, layers of of the educational um, structure, it might actually it would add to the uh, the the theatre's reputation, but it might add to York's reputation and be beneficial to the students who are involved. Yes, and you mean partly um sort of creating aspiration to go to university to yeah. to to study and do that. Um, um, absolutely, I think that is part of our our our, our ambition to support mm -hmm. that, and that's why um we actually run um Julian mentioned some of our youth theatre groups that happen out in the city. Um, we have three groups, four groups now that meet at York St John. Um, and, and part of uh, part of the intention in doing that really was that we we, we felt that creates an, an aspiration and a, and a comfort in being in a university setting. So there's been a, we sort of had a bit of that sort of um, sort of strategy happening as well. So if, that, if that's what you're 
Yes, and, uh, yes, it would. I mean, I, I think that that kind of partnership working between yes. different organisations yeah. is beneficial all the way around, yeah. as Chris yeah. so ably talked, described yeah. earlier. And just, yeah. just to add in, the, the, the York University, I, I've just joined the advisory board for the... Uh, the School of Arts and Creative Technologies. Mm -hmm. So I'm working now with them and they, they're very much talking about it being an industry facing with the students. So it's uh, hopefully the links with that with the university through that advisory board will be really helpful as well. And of course, there's the possibility of feeding that back through York students in schools yeah. to kind of engage yeah. institutions much more, much more closely. Yeah, thank you. If I may just ask one more question, this probably demonstrates my appalling uh, Signals, but certainly out of touchness. Where does the community choir fit in what you've what you've described? Um, yes, as I was looking at Julian's PowerPoint and looked at other projects and thought we really have we really need to add the choir into that. We actually have a range of other activities that 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 where 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 people that are. Um, are engaging in activities that aren't necessarily really specifically kind of theatre skills. Um, we have a huge amount of that kind of activity. We do uh, we do yoga classes, do chair yoga for people. We do, we have um, a sewing group that, that that meets. We have photography groups that meet within our building and do that. And the choir is absolutely one of those that still meets regularly every two weeks and takes part in our in our kind of community productions. And um, we probably should add on to our other project section in that and um, more that what we did. There is there's 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 so much more actually even than we've covered today um that we're doing because we want to be that kind of creative hub for our community i, I realize that and the reason i asked the question was because the choir could be a, a really worthwhile part of of any production i mean not just a, absolutely the yeah. rehearsal and development but the actual production yeah itself. yeah we agree yeah they're, they are they've been in ev um in every one of our community productions since 2012 i think now yeah. um but yes absolutely okay thank you very much thank you did I say Wills? I said Nelson. Nelson. <laughs> it's your writing, sorry. Thank, Nelson. thank you, Chair. Um, I was just wondering sort of two very similarly linked things, uh, one about children and one about communities. Uh, it, I mean, it's wonderful to see all the work that you're doing. Um, and yeah, thank you for putting these slides together and for talking us through it. Um, I will declare a bit of an interest as a councillor for Westfield. I know that we're one of the areas that really need um, kind of <laughs> this, the outreach and the engagement that you're doing. And I know that we are known as one of the harder to reach areas in the city. Um, so my questions are, when you're talking about the your free places for children mm -hmm. on your um, sort of regular programmes, when you're talking about your access all areas, how is it that you are kind of finding those children who are deemed to be kind of eligible for those free places. And then the second part of my question is equally when you're looking at, you know, you mentioned kind of one-off things and exciting things that you're doing in the communities. How is that targeted? Are you looking at areas of the city where there's, you know, the most need for those kind of things and, and how are you going about that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our, the first project that we had with uh, Axel Soleil was 12 to 14s, but then we got increased funding to increase that. So with our 8 to 11s, we we work with work with Maxine and we looked at sort of focusing on the, the Westfield Acom area. So the first thing that we did is approach York High School and say, would you host this as being the hub? Because a lot of these children are going to be coming to your school. And they said yes straight away because it's huge benefits to them in terms of the young people. They're obviously, they're trying to attract young people to come to their to their school, trying to reduce that stigma that York High School has. Um, so then they said yes. So then we approached all of their feeder schools and said, we are doing this program. And so we went in and did tasters in there. Um, and so they would, they, they got the young people that would fit the criteria that they and so all we said to them is the young people that you feel that wouldn't get this opportunity elsewhere that their parents wouldn't even consider it but might be interested in it so Westfield was one of those schools and did originally sort of send young people sort of to to us um from there so that's how we sort of attracted that school with the 12 to 16s that we run um at Tang uh, at Tang for Explore is that that's for young people with learning difficulties so it's right next to Applefield. So we partner with Applefield to, to get young people sort of referred to us then. So we're always, we try never to work in isolation. We're always looking to work with our sort of our city partners in that, in, 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 in that way. Um, and the second part of your question was? It's the same with, with your communities and adult sort of groups. How are you, like, how do you find which groups to get involved with or 
I mean, we're well, sort Hopefully. of looking forward, obviously, that we know that we're looking at Seaborne Roundtree um, for the community for the 25. So that will lead us in terms of where we might, what communities we might be looking to explore. So obviously the around sort of uh, social justice mm -hmm. and, and social deprivation. So and obviously an opportunity for us to really work closely with the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, which we do at New Earswick anyway, because they're uh, that we work at through New Earswick. So we have a connection with them. So that's an opportunity to work with us, to us to work with them and to highlight groups through that through that way. Yeah. But Lydia's having conversations with people sort of all of the time and sort of finding where that where that need, where that need is. And you're never short the people, you know, to sort of to try to, to you know, to try and partner with. The, the... Sorry. I was just saying in York Mind as well, uh, we, we've been running um, uh, classes, sort of mental health and wellbeing classes for a long while. And again, people have come through that way. And I think kind of overall with accessible areas um, that has come it, because it's referral only, it, it sometimes they, it comes from uh, a variety of different kind of um, uh, uh, people who, who might uh, refer a, a young person to us who uh, would benefit from that place. That's brilliant. You said uh, the work at York Hike, you said Westfield did send children. Is that ongoing now or is that something that was kind of a project? Which no, is... we don't sort of currently have a sort of a, um, there was someone uh, called John, I can't remember his son, who was specifically uh, a pastor and I, I believe that that role was no longer picked up within Westfield. So that sort of that relation, we tried to sort of continue that relationship. So that sort of that dropped a little, a little bit. But you but... always have free spaces or sort of funded spaces on your regular programs yeah yeah absolutely so we, yeah we're always keen to to reconnect with any schools that we can okay councillor waller that's a good man westwood primary if you want to connect, reconnect there and i think it's important to ensure that there's a consistent access because i think people if they're familiar with something, then it's like, yeah, we'll join in. But it, it, it's about maintaining that level of awareness uh, in, in the community that this is available and that as new people come through, that it's, it's an opportunity that they can, can exercise. So I think the investment that went into the facilities at York High, it was, um, it was not easy when government wasn't coming forward with the money to be able to have um, those uh, facilities for drama uh, and, and performance space, which wasn't really where the government were looking in terms of where you spent money. So I think it's, it's a tribute to the uh, investment then that it's providing you with a space in that community uh, to provide uh, those uh, those those um, learning opportunities. Thank you. Councillor Croshaw. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of questions uh, on, on slightly different topics in a way. Um, before I ask a question, I'm just going to quickly say um, Lydia has just been fantastic in terms of the, the way that she's engaged with um, Micklegate, you know, my ward, and um, we've done various bits and bobs through um, one of the community food supports, which has just been fantastic. So in terms of targeting and, and engaging uh, people, uh, you know, she's just been a, a, a real credit. Um, I just... Um, it is on. Sorry, I'll, I'll put it right in front of me. Sorry, it's, it's yeah. no worries. Well, you know, how, we, we can't have that happening, can we? <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the, the questions I wanted to ask were sort of related, but, but twofold. Um, and, I, and I suppose they're both on the theme of, um, you know, engaging with the community, but getting different people across the threshold and, 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 and how that works because obviously it's great for people who don't normally experience the theatre to, to experience the theatre but it's obviously great for the theatre to have new people coming in and and you know potentially becoming regular people um so I suppose first of all I was I was wondering in general sense whether there's been thought or discussion about how to use the, the theatre space itself in different ways to try to make it as welcoming as possible for people who perhaps don't ordinarily go to the theatre and come into the space and then actually perhaps think about going to the theatre when they might not have, have otherwise done. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're... we are uh, sorry. <laughs> We're always talking about that, and certainly in terms of, of how we use the building, um, one of the conversations we've been having only recently this week, uh, last week, is is how we extend the opportunity for people to come into our building from early in the morning right through to eleven o'clock at night. Now, it will be some of that will be related to the shows that we put on stage, some will be the activities that we're doing, and some of the you know just the idea that people feel welcome and come just to sit and have a coffee. So it's it it is for us a building that should be open from ten o'clock in the morning till eleven o'clock at night, and that is the norm. I mean, I'm going back now to a, to the opening of a, of a show, and then the, the bar will be open after that show, and we, we keep the bar open after every show so that people can come and have a chat and sit down and talk about what they've just seen as well. Um, so, in terms of the activities, we we are developing a, a number of activities, and we've got plans to expand on that as well over the coming year. Um, it, 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 some of it reflects the work we're doing on stage and where we might be going with that work as well and adding into some of the programming, particularly, for example, in dance. One of the things I'm very keen to develop is the dance offer that we have on stage and some of the people mm -hmm. we bring and then the impact that can have on the work that we do in the community in that area of work and supporting some of the things that are happening already in this in the city. So, yes, it's, it's definitely a conversation and we're certainly looking to always bring new people into the building. And um, just just for a couple of examples, um, for the last few months, we've been uh, running an LGBTQ plus book club, um, which has been fascinating. They've been reading really key key books. A lot of the people that are coming to that are people that have never stepped inside the the theatre building because they haven't felt it's it's for them in whatever in whatever way. Um, and that's 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 been uh, really successful. We've also uh, been uh, obviously working a lot with um, our, um, uh, our our Chinese community, um, British um, East Asian and British South. East Asian uh, uh, people and we've we've uh, we've marked two celebrations in these in this last year the Lunar New Year and also um uh the October uh, um uh, festival um and and so we 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 we're, we're doing things that does that is bringing people through I think I think probably the the most straightforward answer is that is it, to your question is that we try lots of different things you know we're we're we're, we're interested in and and um we want it to be something that does reach and and that people feel is their theatre. That is something that that we 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 feel you know very passionately about. So not everything that we do works works brilliantly in the way that we expect it to. Uh, but where where things sort of seems to sort of take hold and we're getting kind of good results, we keep we keep going with that and we try new things. Um, yeah. Thank you. And and my other question, which was uh, again sort of related in a way, but I know obviously the the um, youth theatre is is been really successful and and um you know I, I can certainly attest on a personal level you know my daughter went through that and 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 you know had a, had a great time uh you know uh, doing things um I in my 20s lived in Edinburgh and I was really involved in uh, music nothing at all to do with theatre um but the Traverse Theatre in Edinburgh had a, a sort of um I don't know whether it was formal or informal but they did some reaching out to people in different industries to get them involved in theatre. And I actually ended up doing some paid work in sound design, which I found amazing uh, as a freelancer. It was a whole new string to my bow and it was it was fantastic. Um, and it seems to me in York that there's quite a lot of people who are really engaged in creative industries. There's a, some really interesting music people. There's some quite interesting, um, we've talked already about digital arts and, and those sorts of things. I don't know to what extent they're engaged with the theatre because I don't know whether they'll have ever even thought about engaging with the theatre and I don't know whether the theatre has ever thought about engaging with those slightly older uh, you know so you've got this sort of young people up to 19 but then that perhaps 20s 30s people who are trying to scratch a living uh, we've probably all been in the same place where you're, you're freelance and, and you take any bit of, of thing that you can um, but I'm just wondering again if there's a any thought around how to engage with some of those people as both support to them, but also really adding something different to, to the theatre as well. I understand what you're, yeah, I tell you what, what you're saying. And um, I mean, it, there's different ways of, of, of doing that. One of, the, one of the ideas we've got at the moment is to open up, uh, is to create something called the old paint shop, which is, um, is turning our studio space into sort of a club type vibe where we can uh, showcase different artists from York in different, you know, with different skills. So it could be music, it could be comedy, it could be a range of different things. Um, 
And so that's one of the ways of trying to open up the venue to, to, to bring people through that are not necessarily only interested in drama that's happening on the stage at that point. Are you talking also about some of the other skills, like you talked about yourself, sound design? Um, it's, a, it's a great thought. And it's, it's, it's something that we can, we, I don't know whether we are doing exactly that, but we, we, we are definitely looking to explore how to engage with people from different skill bases. Yeah. Um, Shall I have that? Yeah. Um, so I think I think um, probably the the closest we got to what you're we're talk, we're talking about was when we came out of the pandemic and we um, we uh, we commissioned twenty two local artists of a huge range of disciplines. I mean, there was uh, and actually we had over two hundred people apply for the for the commissions again from the, an, an enormous range of kind of uh, of of skill sets um and we did that as our way of coming out of the the pandemic to to share with our local artists and and then we repeated that same thing um the following year with a different sort of thematic kind of thing again another 20 artists were commissioned and i think what that began to do was to just shift the relationship between us and our local artist kind of uh, base we now have something called the creative hub which anybody living kind of in in north york and making their living as an artist in whatever discipline can join where we give out um we 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 signpost kind of opportunities that either we're doing or other theatres are doing or other kind of places are doing um and we've kind of we're, we're opening the door we hold um we're starting to do a monthly um what we're calling artist surgery which we've done for the last three months which is basically it's you can book um you can book a slot to just come and have a chat um we're, we're that those are sometimes thematic or it's just come and meet me and talk to me and you know talk to me about, about what's what, what what's going on or what you're trying to work on or what you're doing so we're trying to do much more of, of, of that kind of connection we don't we haven't pitched anything at the moment really specifically to um to the kind that 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 that, 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 that slightly different kind of media industry and, and and kind of surround, surrounding things but we are opening the doors more and I think that's just a, that's a great provocation for us to to, to take away and, and and think about um we had one uh, one year I suppose I think when we worked uh very closely with Mediali and we delivered our takeover festival um with them and that did bring different skill sets in and we do also have a plan for a new project um called Future Proof which we trialed in 2020 which is about sort of um bringing together uh uh, uh young adults who are aspiring to be kind of um uh creatives in different in different creative industries really to bit and and to uh potentially work with other organizations over time time um, with that as well so there are there are things that are kind of in the pipeline but it's that's good to just hear your yeah there's good provocation and what, one final thing the york university the, the, being involved with them now on the advisory group is actually about us how we're engaging with different elements of of the creative industries so with the meeting i'm I, I'm, I'm at is with filmmakers with uh, you know uh, there's a range of different skill bases there uh, and what we're trying to talk about is how do we all work together um, in, and down the line, and because the, 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 the facilities at your university are great, and we've got some representatives, and how we can join those things up is part of our conversation. Okay. Anyone? Well, happy. I've got a couple to throw your way. Um, you mentioned the community venues. How did they become community venues? Did you, you don't own them, do you? I mean, do they apply to say, can we be one of your community venues? No, we just sort of. We looked at what areas of the sorry, we looked at what areas of the city we thought that we wanted to work we wanted to work in. Um so New Earswick was an area that wasn't sort of covered sort of, sort of to the north of the to the north of the city. So we approached sort of New Earswick folk or we, we pay for that we pay for that space. Um and then our other spaces, obviously, that we have a partnership agreement with York College and York St. John, but they're very sort of different parts of the sort of the city. So that works as part of our collaborative partnership with uh, um, with that as well. As I said, Tangle Explore, because it's next to Applefields to access those young young people and York High School, sort of, which I've talked about as uh, talked about as well. So it's mainly looking at the, the, how we can utilise our partnership to, to access that, that space. Right. Cool. And the Ukrainian lady you mentioned mm. is... Did she find you or you find her in terms of if we found another Ukrainian lady mm -hmm. or a similar type, how would how does it work? Do they come to you or do you it's a great stumble question. across them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 
I'm not, said he doesn't know it. I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. But... I, I I I think it might have begun with um with us having Kiev City Belly over, and that actually brought um some people to us who then and then I think I think um uh, the particular person um came into our community production was that the same one. Um, oh, we've had we've 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 got, had quite a good connection with um Ukrainians, but I think that I think it started with that. Um, so you have somebody similar who's fill could fill a niche that you haven't got yet. It's they could come to you, or you may actually stumble across somebody in the same way. There is not a four a set way of meeting those little niches that you know small communities that probably be pre war probably didn't exist. I mean. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think she also came just because she she's got she had a skill set that she's not able to use in this country. Yeah. So we talked to her about, you know, could we employ you as a youth theatre assistant um, and get involved with us? Then, you know, further down the line, could she become a could she become a practitioner? Um, so there isn't a the formal process, but we'll you know our door is always open mm -hmm. to have those conversations. Absolutely. I man, I just realised that. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you appreciate you. your time. We'll, we'll get you back, don't you worry. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Football next. It's going to be fun. It's like proper culture, this, isn't it? <laughs> Before you start, I read somewhere and I haven't kind of done it. There was a motion passed that caused this to happen, didn't it? Yeah. No, I haven't. I'm inefficient today. Just to give you some background of why there was a motion passed at full council and I didn't ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, blimey. I've got the wrong glasses on. <laughs> so as a result of... From the 23rd of November, the fair game campaign for football clubs, the committee will discuss the important role that York City Football Club plays in the culture and heritage of the city. Absolutely. Our members will explore ways in which City of York Council can work together to support York City Football Club. York, York City Football Club foundations with its work in the local community. So that's the consequence that we thought why you've been brought in front of the culture and children's community. So there you go. Yeah. Over to you, Paula. So what I mean, what do you want to know? Um, there's a number of faces that I recognise around the room. Worked with quite a few people over the years. Um, you know, um, we've been ex in existence, um, York City Football Club Foundation in various guises for 26 years, and I've been in post for 15. Um, and I know sort of quite a lot of what York Theatre Royal have talked about. We're very similar, um, engage with as many different individuals in the community. And our aim is to make a positive difference and using um, football, sport and physical activity. And actually, I prefer to focus on the last one generally to make that difference um, rather than as necessarily thinking sport. And therefore, it often rules people out. You know, I wasn't I was always the last person to be picked in the sports team at school. And I, therefore, I feel like I'm, I'm perhaps a, that perfect opportunity. You've talked a lot about how do you engage with people that are harder to reach? I'd have been that person. So we tend to go at, you know, any project that we do based on how do you engage engage with the hardest to reach person um, and, and get them in the door. So um, do you want me to just tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do? Um, I yeah. should probably point out um, Darren Kelly, the general manager of the York City Football Club, was also invited this evening and sent his apologies. It's, he's at St George's Park today. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, the Football Club Foundation runs as a, as a separate entity to the football club. But as I say, um, we essentially are the charity working under the football family banner um, to make a difference in the community. We have three key arms, our community inclusion and female. Um, I always come to female last, but by no means least. I'll explain why in a minute. Community is our bread and butter. It's about how we engage predominantly with young people, primary school age young people. Um, we do a lot of work working in primary schools, working in community settings, working with local grassroots uh, football club organisations, um, both in terms of delivery of sport and physical activity, but also um, in projects around uh, other physical and mental health um, and, um, and any way we can really engage young people um, 
positive diversionary activities, um, interventions in numeracy, literacy, PSHE, uh, education activations in school, um, and also working to upskill teachers. So we've got a programme called Premier League Primary Stars, which is a national programme that we've been engaging with for about five years now um, and upskilled about 70 primary school teachers. So you talked earlier about, you know, um, funding going into schools and how do you create that legacy? So that is part of that project for us. It's about how we actually work with teachers in schools to ensure they can deliver PE in exactly the same manner as they might deliver maths or English. So they're looking at a class and how they can approach a class um, and ensure that every individual child within that class has their learning outcomes met. Um, so, so we do a whole host of different things for uh, young people. Primary age, we also do holiday activities and we've engaged with the Holiday Activity Food Funding Programme. Marcus um, uh, Rashford was amazing with that, obviously, but we were campaigning for that a lot, lot longer before he was. So we were on that bandwagon from uh, late 2016, early 2017. I've been part of the what was formerly the Food Poverty Alliance and various other groups over that time. Um, and we've touched as well upon tonight the um, false... Um, impression that York is a hugely affluent city um, and uh, you know our experience has been that it's not just pockets that are not affluent there are some huge areas um, where there are issues both in terms of physical mental health and um, obesity uh, lack of taking part in physical activity and food poverty that obviously all go very much hand in hand so we've done a lot of work over the years and we've been delighted to engage with the Holiday Activity Food Programme. We've also funded um, alongside the provision there um, for the last two years so that we have our Happy Healthy Holidays Programme running every school holiday, not just the holiday weeks that half comes. Uh, so that's something that we've uh, we felt was quite important to gain momentum on. Uh, what else have we got? Um, so then leading into our inclusion programme is where we tend to lead into uh, young people, um, which traditionally would have been 11 to 25s. But as we've seen over the years, those positive diversionary activities have actually needed to be much younger um, to address some of the antisocial behaviour agenda locally. So we actually have a programme starting from age eight through to 17. Um, and then that runs straight through to our adult programme and activities. So again, Positive activities within the community. We've worked in um, Westfield, uh, Huntington, Tang Hall, um, Clifton uh, for numerous years. Uh, Strensel as well, where we've run our youth club in previous years. We've done a lot of activity and and uh, uh, projects over the years where we've been commissioned or um, we've won won the opportunity to go out and actually do a lot of young people consultation. Um, and it all comes back with the same thing. They just want positive activities where they can take take part in something and have some safe space. So we run a project called City Kickabout, which has been going probably about 10 years now, actually. Um, and uh, we stepped in as the uh, former youth service provisions were sort of initially being reduced and have continued to sort of have, have developed that and, and offer something. So we're still in... Um, uh, let me think, Westfield and uh, Huntington. Uh, so essentially at York High and Huntington Secondary School twice a week um, and managed to resurrect them with help from the, the wards actually post-COVID. Um, and then we've just secured some um, uh, police fire crime commissioner funding alongside a consortium of other organisations across the city to actually deliver some monthly activities in Westfield and in Clifton and to try and get our foot back in the door, particularly in the Clifton area, where we know um, there's a lot of, of, of ongoing issues. Um, and we were at the recent uh, police event, the Clearhold Build event, and how we can engage in that longer term. Um, we do a lot, obviously, around uh, both physical and mental health. So we have a programme called Boot the Blues, which is a men's mental health programme. Um, and um, in addition to that, working alongside a number of corporate partners. Uh, so Porter Cabin have just supported us to actually develop that programme further, where we're going to be developing monthly tackle it sessions as a peer support group for men. Um, we're looking at what that might look like longer term, potentially for women. But we want to do a little bit more consultation first as to what do they want rather than us assuming. Um, and uh 
And then also um, alongside the Boot the Blues and Tackle It, we've got an annual event that we run around uh, tackling stigma, um, which we've run in conjunction with York Mind. Uh, and we're looking to do health walks. So developing some of the things that we did during COVID um, was to support um, any of our participants in the wider community um, with anything from um, addressing social isolation and loneliness to, you know, going out there and doing their shopping. Um, so one of the things we found, particularly we did a lot around social prescribing, and we did a lot of doorstep visits and walk and talk. So we're trying to get back some of those um, elements where we felt it was really important, just getting out there, going for a walk, connecting, um, being in, you know, our open green spaces across York as well. Um, and, and at the top end of our, um, our adult programme, we have uh, an open age walking football programme. And we also have our sporting memories group. Um, and we affect affectionately nick them, nickname them our golden oldies. It's like having 50 sets of grandparents, um, but it's also a highlight of our week. Uh, so twice a week we run a um, sporting memory session, which has become essentially a social and support group for older people uh, within our community. And they were very much a, a group that we supported throughout the pandemic, through all three lockdowns, and uh, found that it became a lifeline for us as much as it was for them. And then, as I say, I always come to female last um, because of the fact it crosses across the first two. Um, so we do a lot of girls only activities where we've recognised over the years that it's important to have um, girls only activities to ensure that they are taking part and don't feel excluded. Um, we're just about to launch across schools in York a girls resilience project. So it's about using sport and physical activity, but actually tackling some of the issues that we're very much aware of post-pandemic for girls uh, called Be Your Personal Best. And that's a, a, a motto that we run through all of our, our girls' programmes. Um, we have, across both boys and girls, a talent pathway and a, a skills uh, centre and player pathway. Um, so whilst we are more about recreation and about um, making a difference. We also recognise we can make a difference by actually developing the skill set as well in terms of young players. But I'm probably most proud uh, of what we've done on the girls' side um, because we have, on the girls' side, we have everything from our recreational wildcat centres through to our emerging talent centre, which is, as it sounds, eight to 12-year-olds. Then our regional talent centre, which has been an FA-funded programme up to the last year. They decided to pull our entire funding because of change of how that uh, uh, that um, that platform lies um, but we have currently have Jess Park who was with us for many years and is part of the England Lionesses and unlike in men's football we just have uh, the benefit of being able to sit here and say how amazing it is that Jess came through our ranks there's no money that changes hands in girls football so there's no financial recompense that comes back to support us to continue to do that. Um, and then we also run York City Ladies and it's something I never thought I'd be able to say is actually running of a football club would sit under my jurisdiction but as it's part of um, the pathway that we have you know for our girls the top of that pathway is York City Ladies currently playing tier four women's national league for our first team we also have a development team and an under 23s so um, we're very busy engaging every week um, there isn't a quiet time for the Football Club Foundation, probably Christmas holiday week when we shut. Um, and we're all very grateful for, for, for a week's break. Um, but we're very passionate about what we do and about making a difference and see approximately probably 2,000 people on an average week, um, aged between three and 90 something. So very much cover a huge range of the community. I thought it was interesting when I was looking at your remit um, as a scrutiny committee um, that actually I highlighted we cover nearly all. There's probably only two or three areas in there that we don't sort of cross over with. So um, hopefully it's very relevant of us to be here. Very impressive. Pleasure. Questions, <laughs> Councillor? Uh, oh, sure, is a Yes. <laughs> Paul, I think you're a saint for having waited so long. And it, it's <laughs> lovely to I'm see sorry, you I've got a graveyard shift. Uh, I, I got comments and then a question. Um, I, I wanted to say that the work you do in Huntington and New Year's Week is particularly appreciated. And the three of us think this is an excellent way of spending some of our ward money. 
Uh, what I wanted to ask you actually is the other end of the scale. Do you do things like walking football? Yes. I don't think you mentioned it, but I had a feeling that you did. Could you mention that? Yeah, absolutely. We do walking football. Originally started out actually working alongside the council over 50s officer. Um, but these days, we wouldn't class walking football as an over 50s um, activity. It's open for any age. Um, for those people that might be a little bit more sedentary, sed sedentary um, potentially recovering from um, injury or surgery, um, just generally, it's a slow a paced version of the game um, and we have uh, four sessions three open sessions and we've just recently started a session working with Parkinson's UK that we funded um, through some of the, of the Parkinson's funding to actually build a closed group specifically for those people that have Parkinson's which we've found has you know been an amazing um, opportunity and certainly a demand there from week one we've had a, an engaged group of 12 to 16 every week um so really you know a really really good group that, that are joining us on a weekly basis thank you um well it's just so i'm just so excited about this because i think it's a real success story particularly the women's game um just this is just an, a, a thought uh, that came to me when my son was at primary school every little boy's birthday party was at Booth and Crescent um and That's I'm just probably all gonna be here. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just wondering is with with the development of the women's game with the success of the lionesses with the programs you're running are you seeing with the birthday parties that a significant increase in girls wanting to hold their parties there because I think that would be a good reflection of how they and their their peers are feeling. Yeah. I mean to be fair we've stopped running the birthday parties um so changes that brew them present as we've moved into the new stadium. However yes I have seen a, a real difference Interestingly, we often use various campaigns like um, International Women's Day, Her Game 2, to flag those things. It's important that we see that throughout the year, but it's great to showcase what we're doing using those campaigns. And as part of those in this last month, we've actually engaged with some of our um, our younger girls. Um, so we tried to do sort of something that was sort of both sides. Our ladies players, we talked to them about what would their advice be to you know their younger self. Um, and our younger players, we approached them and ask them what would they like to be when they grow up what, what were they aspiring to be two or three years ago we would have still had most of those girls telling us that they wanted to be vets and doctors and um, nurses whatever it was and maybe play football interestingly this time um, two of our under 12s in particular quite a few of them but two under 12s in particular not only told us that they want to be professional footballers they told us where they wanted to play um, Newcastle Arsenal Man City you know they actually had not just aspirations to play and use that and I see that as a um, you know as, as a real um, tangible uh, potent you know potential for them but they'd actually thought about what they could do, where they could do, what that might look like, which to us, that's a huge win. So, Councillor Wells, then Councillor Nelson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Paula. That, one of the things about tonight is it's been so exciting hearing all these ideas and um, seeing the passion that everybody has. Mm. One of the things that we... That, that was discussed was whether or not people were in competition. Do you feel that you're in competition with um, other grassroots football or sports organisations? Yeah, not grassroots football, because we very much engage with the local grassroots community and the volunteers there um, and try and sort of build those things in as much as possible. So, for example, York City Ladies, we engage with grassroots teams um, every week to come down and be part of our match day experience. Um, you know, and be sort of flag wavers and ball girls and, and that kind of thing. Um, yes, what we would call the white van men, um, without sounding sexist, but generally our men. Um, over the years, yes, there are competition, um, but they tend to be, that's focused very much on player development. Um, we do the player development, but it's only one aspect of, you know, a much wider variety. Um, and my view over the years has, as we've developed, 
um, having been in post a long period of time. We saw it as competition over the years. We go out there, we do what we do best. Um, there's enough room probably for most of us. Um, we try to look at it if we're, because we're about making a difference, if we're delivering something exactly the same as somebody else or in the same place, we're more likely to take our, our activity elsewhere. So that, you know, actually it's about providing that opportunity to some children or adults, whatever, in an area that don't have it. And therefore we try and put that on. Um, so that's generally been our, our way of tackling things over the years. And of course, most of what we do is free or low cost. Um, so even as a community ethos, so our holiday activities, as an example, I was telling a parent last week, um outside of the workplace and when I told her what we charge for our daily activity she gasped so we're equivalent of £12.50 a day whereas private providers are somewhere between 20 and £28 a day for the equivalent provision so it's still very important to us that even when we are charging for something it's got a community ethos so that price isn't the barrier to attending okay Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you for your presentation. Uh, apologies on behalf of everybody involved for you having to wait. Um, no, it's fine. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to the others, actually. <laughs> um, I couldn't see you getting excited as things progress, but anyway, glad you Um The ward that I represent, um, members are very grateful for what you do on behalf of the community. But I wondered if you could speak um, a little bit more about your uh, connection with the uh, youth justice team and how um, you can address issues of antisocial behaviour, misbehaviour generally. Um, it's something that happens not too often in, in Hagsby and Wigginton, but when it does happen, there's a lot of disquiet about it. Mm -hmm. So anything more you can say about that will be very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we first got involved in Haxby and Wigginton, it was off the back of antisocial behaviour, you know, issues that, that we've been dealing with. And you know, I'm, I'm probably a little bit biased because I'm Wigginton based. So um, it was something that we felt that was very important to, to address. Um, and I think now having more years under my belt, I think potentially these things seem to come round cyclically. Um, you know, uh, it's a little bit like, while well, you're busy addressing an area over here, you find that there's then more of an area over here. Um, and I think our just our, our biggest successes come from continuing to work as much in partnership with different people and putting ourselves out there, which, to be fair, us as an organisation, like many, you know, we run as a charity. Um, and so during COVID, whilst we wanted to deliver as much as possible, we also had to be quite mindful of the fact that if we didn't make some very careful decisions, including furloughing staff, we weren't going to exist post COVID. Um, and we did have a long period of time following the, the pandemic of recovery. And I, I think it's only really been in this last season that I've felt that we've actually achieved that recovery and are now back to a period of, of um, having sustained it and ready to grow again. Um, that has then meant that myself as the person that's more of the strategic person, you know, for representing the foundation can get back out again. Um, and I think the importance of even sitting and hearing tonight what the other organisations are doing, um, networking in, in these um, kind of um, um, situations, um, the, the recent police um, clear hole build event, getting back out into those various locations, having had um, the ward meetings in past years that have been partnership meetings. Personally, I found those very useful because we could sit around the table, not only with the, the local councillors, but with the um, the other partners that are delivering in those areas and find out are we having the same issues and, and cross referencing those and seeing then how we can help. So I think potentially it's a, probably about re reestablishing more of those networks and partnerships so we can then work out where needs our support first. <laughs> probably um and building it um and you know in terms of young people it always seems to come back to the same things they want a safe space they want um inspiring role models they want um positive activity that they can take part in um often they don't know what 
they want until you can lead them a little bit. I remember doing consultation in Strensel where they wanted a built-in trampoline bed in the um, uh, Northfields Park. I was, I'm a fabulous idea, but it's never going to happen. <laughs> um, but but actually, would a youth club, you know, be a good idea? Actually, yes, that would be the next best thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's probably about as engaging as much as possible. Um, talking to young people and talking to the various partners and how we can work together because there just isn't enough capacity from any of the third sector organisations locally for us all to do everything we'd like to do. But if we can work together and see how we can connect um, and cross promote each other, um, be aware of, of what each other's doing and, you know, um, share resources, I guess, to some extent and experiences then, the more the more we're likely to right well in that case i must have a conversation with you as a resident of the ward i do <laughs> yeah, thank you I'll, we'll pick up a few points later thank you very much thank you Jen. i just wanted to very briefly thank you for everything that you're doing with the foundation it is um brilliant to hear about the impact that you're having on the lives of you know, people of all ages across the city. Um, I suppose I just wanted to draw attention, I guess, to the council plan, which is about health, yeah, putting health in everything that we do, which clearly you're embodying in the work that you're doing as a foundation already, um, but just very welcome to kind of continue those discussions and just ensure that we are maximising the effectiveness of everything that you're doing for the, the residents that need you and you're doing a brilliant job. So thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I, I also just think it's fantastic the work the City Football Club Foundation does. Uh, I know that you do a lot with us in Westfield in the holidays. Um, that kind of so one of the aspects of the motion and one of the things we wanted to discuss is how we can, as a council, work more closely with uh, you guys to to reach these aims that all of us who've been here tonight are, are working towards. Um, which got me thinking about sort of a couple of things. It's, we've got things like the City Kickabout, which is fantastic, but relies on ward funding. And actually that makes me think about whether there's any ways that the council can support maybe like applications into bigger pots of funding that could, you know, to support that maybe and whether there would be capacity to increase that if as a council there's some sort of, going in the air. I don't know if council officers are going to start throwing things at me. Um, but, you know, I'm wondering whether, like, basically how we as a council might be able to support through funding applications and things like that. Um, I know that the PFCC funding that you mentioned, if that's the one that I think it is, it was actually coordinated by a council officer. Yeah, well. um, so, you know, it's fantastic. Like, I was so pleased to see that work being done. That was a fantastic piece of work by Michal. But, like, more of that maybe, you know, and thinking about it from that kind of perspective when we as a city are looking for, for funding to do things. Um, and then the other thing that seems to link into that is the youth network um, and the youth strategy that uh, council officers are working on. And so they're kind of the things in my head where I'm thinking we're doing stuff, but where do you, do you see kind of areas where we could do more of that to support you in getting the things you need to do the amazing work you're doing yeah and I, and I hate to say funding is is one of the key things because it always is and it's not like I'm sitting here with my cap out but um and, and in fact the two um city kickabout projects in um uh that we run at Energize and Huntington are no longer funded by ward counselling they've actually been funded by persimmon homes last season and this season because that's what we did we went out to find sustainability funding um and continue to try and work with them to um, hopefully keep them funding it year on year um similarly with porter cabin so it, one of my strategic aims over the last couple of years is how do we build in some of our corporate partners locally and, and get them engaged that um, not only is from their sort of CSR perspective, but also from Supporter Cabin's perspective as an employer in the city, we are doing adult driven programmes. So it will benefit their employees as well as so for, from an employer perspective. Uh, rather than just showcasing them as a good employer. So, um, but yeah, I think, you know, being aware of 
of more opportunities where potentially we can come together as organizations so as i say sometimes that networking that that pulling together of the different organizations that can potentially you know put in bids jointly um one of the things that we are going to be struggling with um is we have run city kickabout in the parks for six seven years we ran it every year even throughout the pandemic um and obviously because of limitations potentially in ward funding we ha don't have any any parks projects so far for this summer so if that's something that the you know council would consider um you know we've run that in anything between six and 12 parks over the last you know three or four years um and that's about you know activity taking the weekly kickabouts and it is just that as drop in um you can book on um but you can also drop in um in park spaces utilizing you know the good and beautiful, lovely green spaces across the city in we normally try and run easter and summer um and dot them around so i think we've had sort of two and a half to three thousand young people taking part you know in the last couple of summers alone and i know that's actually reduced slightly in size um from previous years so if there's any support anywhere with something like that, I would be very appreciative because I don't know where that's going to be funded from otherwise. So it might not run. Um, and I guess being able to have open communication, um, you know, it's really nice to see. I've, there's plenty of faces I do know, but there's faces I don't as well. So having those conversations in the different wards so we know what the issues are, how we can help to address those things. Um, and I guess linking in more on the football club itself side of things, you know, how can we get, engage with our community and get them into that lovely community stadium? <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'd like to thank you for all the work that uh, you've done um, and the, uh, the vision, which, yes, I too, unbelievably, was the last to be picked when uh, it <laughs> came to uh, finding the football team at school. Um, but I think that sense of it, it's available to all um, is, has been really important. I, I would be devastated to lose the kickabout in the in the summer and uh, Easter because that's been a significant input um, at times of antisocial behaviour and uh, the sense of you were there when there were not many other organisations yeah. able to come along and deliver something that the young people were actually interested in and and wanted to do, but you were able to overlay with a sense of partnership on team working and social responsibility and you leapt at the opportunity of getting in back, keeping areas tidy. Yeah. So that's a really picking aspect of it. Um, and I think it your personal enthusiasm shows through um, starting at a time when York City Football Club is one not renowned for <laughs> inclusivity. <laughs> shall we just draw a veil over that, that period? And so this is light years beyond that. And in terms of a constantly evolving uh, range of things that you're doing for a, a wider range of people. So I think it's important that uh, anything that the council does works with you because there are thousands of young uh, kids rely on that. And because you've been able to program ahead, it's helped with schools to let people know well in advance that this is happening on this day. You can't always predict the weather, but you do get out there uh, and provide those opportunities in the summer holidays when people are really scratching for things to do with the kids. Yeah. That it's there, it's free, the access is, is wonderful. So you've done a sterling work. Yeah, I think perhaps it's a touch sort of made me think there that one of the issues often around funding is not accessing funding. It's how we access funding long term or how we access funding um, that uh, instead of potentially looking at summer, we're scrabbling around now considering summer. What I'd prefer to be doing is no summer is in the bag and we're looking at next year and the year ahead. Um, and how we as an organisation, um, we're not funded at all by the football club. I will make that very clear. So there's no funding that comes that way because of where the football club sits. Um, we're not um, uh, uh, English Football League. So there's no 
um, unrestricted funding that comes to us. Um, any funding pots that we have been successful with over the last couple of years, particularly, are through our own going out, finding them, researching them, um, applying, being successful and having a really good um uh, reputation in terms of the way we deliver and um, being able to go back and actually saying that we've delivered what we said we were going to do how we said we we're going to do it and um and in the timely manner and um, we recognize how important it is in terms of that impact reporting whether it be to yourselves or any funder or even for example persimmon and porter cabin it's part of our approach to them so that they see the difference that it's making in our community so long-term provision any any support in that respect would be great sure. Can I just, uh, as a follow-up question, the SWOT committees have been top slice. I would have thought that as a, a citywide uh, division, that, that that's what that top slicing was about, ensuring that there was that strategic view for you to be able to plan. Yeah. So if we can have a, an answer on that, I think it'd be great. So that could go to any of the three at the end, I think. <laughs> Uh, yeah i can answer that um uh i think you've had feedback from the process yes i believe I um they weren't successful they were just trying to remember the numbers over 30 organizations that applied and the total that was applied for was three times the what was available so unfortunately um it, it's that it reflects the demand, I think, yeah. on the system yeah. uh, from voluntary and community organisations, um, which I think is going to be the challenge going forward. Councillor Nelson with supplementary. Thank you. Um, I, I think perhaps part of the point here, because I'm thinking about, you know, our ward funding in Westfield and what we're going to be doing in the summer. And, you know, we're really committed to putting activities on for our children, but we haven't got around to thinking about summer yet. Um, and I think that may be part of the problem and actually may, maybe some of the process here would be um, to have a clearer understanding between ward committees and, you know, you guys of like when, when you need decisions made by in order to put things in place, yeah. for example, because um, these things kind of, they're really, really important. They can also just arrive, can't they? You think yeah. you've got six months and then you've suddenly got two months and then, you know, so actually maybe part of um, how we could make this work better is to have a really clear set of timescales of like, you know, when you need. And I know that some of this does come through our community officers. Yeah. Um, but house. it often comes through our community officers in like a discussion form, like, by the way. So actually, I'm wondering, you know, it might be something that we could look into in terms of almost formalising for all wards that, you know, here are organisations that you can spend ward funding on, but actually this is the lead in that people need um, to know about it. Um, you know, ju just something like that, that would be yeah. helpful so that you're not waiting for different organisations yeah. individually to say, well, actually we need six weeks notice or we need one week's notice or um, we can do it, you know. Yeah, hopefully that makes We've sense. We've worked with, um, Mikhail, you mentioned yeah. earlier actually as um, coordinator of some of our citywide stuff um for the last couple of years really um he has our quote by mm. christmas we ask for the information for easter by february and the information for summer by april or march i think originally i said so that information has been with your cios since december thank you That's yeah. sure. just, just on that I, I think one of the problems has been because we don't get not funding settled well it's, yeah. it's not about not understanding it it's about Ward funding has been yeah. year on year on year. Yeah. And if you're saying you need to know for summer for April, well, we don't know yet. Yeah. And that's, and, and that's yeah. yeah. So uh, I think um, one of the things that we've been looking at with yeah. ward funding um, as an administration is actually that longer term thing, yeah. because it's not just yourselves, it's a yeah. lot of organisations in the city that can't plan because there hasn't been that longevity. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's vital. Anyway. Lovely. Thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank our, you. Our pleasure. <laughs> I'll, I did send around the um, presentation, which was something you sort of you saw I'd done, but other people put this copies there if anybody Thank wants to you. have a... Send one down. Send it down.
Well, yeah. Just, we are now on to work plan. We're nowhere on the side. This is, we haven't come to a conclusion, have we? We've got a not this the main committee meeting made to say. The how can not work out well? Yeah. So this potentially work plan for some maybe the last meeting, might not it? Because we're changing them. This is the last of the year, isn't it? And some people are busy next year, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, my so, so hopefully you'll all be back in May um for the next meeting. Um and we shall finalise the um, work plan for the year prior to that. Um, we'll circulate so if anyone's got any thoughts Please ping them in if you're thinking you're continuing your roles. I'm in a fortunate position of a small group. There's little choice for us, lot. <laughs> we could have a fisticuffs if you like, but there's not a lot of choice between the three of us. So I am going to continue as a Conservative member for this committee. Um, so thank you everybody for the last year. Hopefully I'll be back. I've appreciated your support. The complete virgin. I've been a councillor and the chairman of the committee. Um, I think um, I've enjoyed it. Hopefully the rest of it. I think our meetings, despite the fact they go on, have always been very interesting. So we had a, a meeting the other week, um, a uh, chairs meeting, um, which we appeared to do much better than the rest by listening to. I don't know that may be just mm -hmm. my interpretation, but we appear to go much, much nicer, carry on. Uh, Reese does a very good job because some of the things that others were saying didn't happen. I kept saying, well, Reese does that. Mm -hmm. So either Reese is working too hard or I'm being too lazy, but between us, we get there. So thanks, Reese. Um, another virgin this year as well. This is your first year, Jim. <laughs> Just because you're not. <laughs> Bring them. Oh, I knew what you were. I'm sure he was. <laughs> yeah. So, um, work, work, work plan will come to the next meeting and no urgent business. Call the meeting close at five past eight. Thank you very much.